is going out live on YouTube. So it's been um, advertised right around the world. So we're gonna be joined by quite a, <coughs> a number of people over the, uh, the coming events. There'll be a break for, for lunch. You'll see that on your programs. And we'll be doing a bit of reorganizing for the rest of the events in the afternoon. So um, in terms of, sorry. So um, again, thank you, thank you very much for your attention. And um, again, just to make you aware that, that that's taking place uh, now. So um, we'll keep you informed as the day progresses um, of what's uh, actually happening. So uh, thank you. Jiyiba Hauja. significant lacuna. It was assembled in English by Roger Farrell in about the year 1709. It is clear that in assembling this extensive corpus, he was working from medieval Gaelic genealogies, many of which have no longer survived. So therefore, the importance of this collection can be measured by the fact that it presents and it preserves lost genealogies which will greatly aid research into clan and family history. As the compilation was made in the early 18th century, and obviously over half a century after the Cromwellian confiscations, it provides a very useful and visceral link to those wanting to connect ancestors from the 18th century back to, the pre -Cromwell, back to their pre-Cromwellian standing of the mid 17th century and earlier. So shortly, my colleague who was involved in the transcription, Hannah McAuliffe, a PhD candidate at Trinity College, will explain in greater detail the significance of Lydia Antica, both for research and for scholarship. However, at this juncture, I want to reach out to all of you, those physically present here today, and of course, many of those who join us online, and ask for your support so that this project may be realized. What we propose is to have a list of distinguished sponsors for the project, which will be commemorated in every printed volume of the genealogy. These sponsors may be individuals or clans, and their donation, donation will cover the cost of transcription of the genealogy, which will be in the order of about 4,000 euros. The transcription is a very large and very significant undertaking, running to over 240 folios, and will be professionally transcribed and printed in a bound volume, complete with a detailed introduction and index. The suggested contribution is 350 euros per sponsor, and for this generous donation, sponsors will receive a signed copy of the printed volume, and their name and location will be inscribed in a dedicated list of sponsors printed up front in each and every volume. Given that the realization of this project will be the largest publication of genealogical material uh, since the publication of Dwaltic McIrvishig's Great Book of Genealogies, your sponsorship will indeed make a significant difference in bringing this remarkable set of Irish genealogies to light after more than 300 years. So with that said, I shall invite my colleague, Hannah, who will be responsible for transcribing the work and who will provide a more detailed overview of Linear Antica and its importance in Irish geological research. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Luke. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so hello everyone, my name is Hannah, um, and as Luke mentioned, I am currently doing a PhD in Trinity College, where I'm looking at early medieval Irish dynastic succession, so I'm looking at um, the ways the different families of early Ireland interacted with each other and chose their kings. 
As Luke also outlined, um, the Linnea Antiqua is a document of huge historical significance for anyone interested in medieval Irish history or genealogy and family history. Being a medievalist of early Ireland with a particular interest in um, dynastic and genealogical histories, I'm both of those things. Um, and so I'm hoping that I can give you a good insight into both the provenance of the manuscript um, as well as why it's con considered so important by scholars today. The manuscript is currently housed in the genealogical office of the National Library of Ireland. And as Luke said, it is a grand total of 242 folios of about A35, so it's a big book. It has been described by scholars in the past as the most extensive source for Gaelic genealogy and for the arms associated with, the, with these Gaelic families. And it's one of several early modern compilations of genealogical material. The other early modern genealogy that you're probably all familiar with um, is Dilthog McCurvishig's um, Book of Genealogies. And this was produced in Galway in the mid 17th century, so just before the Linnea Antiqua. This places the Linnea Antiqua among an early modern tradition of genealogical compilation, and so it's part of this important early modern tradition that we have in Ireland. It was compiled by a man named Roger O'Farrell, um, and while we don't know a whole lot about O'Farrell from other historical sources, um, we're fortunate enough that he did include his own family pedigree in the Linnea Antiqua, so we do have the history of the O'Farrells in the book. Uh, from this, we know that he was of the O'Farrell family from Longford, um, and at the time of compilation, he was living in the town of Ballycorky in County West Mead. He was the great-grandson of a man named Ariel O'Farrell Boy, who was the Gaelic Lord of South and Mali. And then we also know that he was appointed Irish historiographer to uh, Queen Anne around the same time as he was writing the Linnea Antiqua. So he had quite a high profile both amongst Anglo-Irish communities in Ireland and Gaelic families. And so he was quite important in that regard. He began compiling the manuscript in 1709, um, but it seems that he might have continued adding to it until 1712, which makes the manuscript over 300 years old today. If we go to the next slide. Maybe we should just, yeah, there we go. So, yeah. So as I mentioned a minute ago, um, the contents of the Linnea Antiqua are made up of pedigrees, genealogical histories, and coats of arms for all of the major Gaelic and Anglo-Irish families of Ireland. These families include, but are not limited to, the O'Sullivans, the O'Mahonys, the McMahons, the O'Hickeys, the O'Days, the O'Maras, and the O'Connors and O'Moores, O'Lochlands, McCurtains, O'Kellys, McSweeney's, O'Flaherty's, Birmingham's, O'Shaughnessy's, uh, Kearney's, Fitzpatrick's, Fitzgerald's, Burke's, Lynch's, O'Neill's, O'Brien's, McCarthy's, and O'Donnell's. And I'm sure some of you might have heard your names in there. It's a very long list. Um, my own family pedigree, the McAuliffe's, are in there as well. Um, I suppose it's kind of a personal interest for me um, in this book as well. Uh, the manuscript is written in plain English, um, which immediately makes it unique from a lot of the other early modern um, compilations, um, because a lot of them were written in Irish. So it already has this kind of um, unique perspective. It's easy to read for the most part, but it does include quite a few odd abbreviations of words and it conforms to early modern spellings and conventions. So it, it can be kind of tricky to work through in that regard. O'Farrell's original work and marginal notes are written in ink, um, but there are also later 19th century annotations made by Sir William Betham in pencil. And they're starting to fade, but you can still make them out and they're still um, quite helpful in their own regard. Rather interestingly, the manuscript opens with a section focused on tracing the origins of the peoples of Ireland back to the biblical Adam. The section details the legendary waves of invasion said to have brought human settlement to Ireland, um, and it mirrors attempts to do the same thing in both medieval texts, like the 12th century Lever Gavala Aaron, um, and other early modern texts like Geoffrey Keating's Forest Mather Aaron. This opening section is then followed by king lists um, for all of the major provincial kingdoms of medieval Ireland, um, cl including the modern provinces of uh, Munster, Leinster, Connacht, and Ulster, and the fifth royal kingdom of Meath. This in particular is really helpful for medievalists like me um, because um, it, it kind of brings all of the king lists into one place and you don't have to go looking elsewhere for them. They're all kind of um, together on one page. The king lists are then followed by the pedigrees of each family. And each pedigree includes a written section um, detailing the generations of a family, as well as a description of each family's coat of arms, as you can see on the PowerPoint now. Um, and it looks like there might have been an intention to illustrate the coats of arms here, because some of them do have um, uh, uh, coats of arms filled in with illustration, but not all of them are. Some of them are just described in um, English. 
Um, if we move on to the next slide. Most interesting for me, um, and probably for a lot of people, um, are the family trees that are included in the text. They're hand-illustrated uh, uh, trees, um, and they're to kind of illustrate the, the contents of each pedigree. Uh, these family trees take on the appearance of actual trees. You can see that there are kind of branches connecting each generation. Um, and they begin at the bottom with the progenitor of a line, and they branch outwards then with all of the clan's descendants. Some of the trees, such as the one on the left here of the Magenitus, um, are quite simple, they're easy to follow, you can trace the lines quite easily, whereas um, some other ones, such as this one here on the right, are much more convoluted and complex, and they tend to overlap quite a bit, and it takes a lot more kind of concentration to follow the, the branches of the tree. Some of the trees, like the one on the right here, um, also feature red, green, or yellow ink to highlight particular branches, um, and that kind of makes it easier to follow. Um, and also kind of adds another illustrative element to the, to the manuscript. Um, if we go on to the next slide, Luke. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, genealogical manuscripts like the Living Antiqua are of the utmost import importance to medievalists and genealogists alike. We don't have a huge amount of genealogical material left at this point, so when we do have something like the Linea Antiqua, um, it's really important to preserve it to the best of our ability. It's part of a much greater tradition of genealogical history in Ireland, and the significance of this for scholars really can't be understated. The earliest genealogies that we have in Ireland uh, all, uh, trace all the way back to the fifth century um, in the form of a series of poems about the earliest kings of Leinster. And that's a tradition that's over 1,500 years old now, so that's the tradition that the Linea Antiqua slots into. Most of our medieval genealogies, like the Book of Leinster, uh, were compiled much later than this in the 12th century, but they are important in their own right uh, due to the fact that they base their contents on much earlier source material. From the end of the 14th century, we start seeing other genealogical compilations, such as the Book of Imana and the Book of Ballymoat, and even later again in the 15th century, the Laud 610 manuscript is produced. After that then, we enter the early modern period and we start seeing um, these early modern manuscripts like McFurbishig's Book of Genealogies and the Linea Antiqua appearing. And again, these slot into this history of genealogical compilation in Ireland. Irish genealogies tend to follow a trend of tracing Irish families back to Ehrman, um, who was one of the sons of Neil Espana. And Neil was the last of the legendary invaders of Ireland. Um, and we see him in the Linea Antiqua, um, wherein his line um, is traced back to the um, biblical Adam through the sons of Noah. So we see that throughout um, genealogical material from early Ireland. So these earlier manuscripts that I've described um, are important for us today because they seem to be at the foundation of the Linea Antiqua. There is no clear reference in the Linea Antiqua manuscript to the sources used by O'Farrell, but by comparing its contents to other genealogical manuscripts, you can better understand the sources that he was working with. With McFurbish's Book of Genealogies or the works of O'Clary, um, but there are also elements in the text that are only found um, elsewhere in the much earlier manuscript. The Rollinson B502 manuscript dates to the early 12th century, um, and the fact that there are elements in the Linea Antiqua that only appear elsewhere in the Rollinson B502 manuscript suggests that um, O'Farrell may have had access to these much earlier, um, uh, earlier genealogical documents. Uh, most significantly, as a result of the link to Rollinson B502, um, it's entirely possible that the Linea Antiqua contains traces or elements of the even earlier Psalter of Cashel. This was a genealogical text compiled in either the late 10th or early 11th centuries in Munster, and it serves as the main source for many of the surviving medieval manuscripts that we have today. It itself went missing from Kildare in the 17th century, and so the fact that the Linea Antiqua may have, um, uh, may have uh, links to it um, is really important for medievalists and genealogists alike. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, genealogical manuscripts like these are helpful to historians and genealogists for several reasons. Um, interpreting genealogical material can not only allow us to understand the history of names and families in Ireland, but to better understand family relationships and marriage alliances in the medieval and early modern period. Through genealogical documents, uh, we can put interactions between dynasties and kingdoms into a genealogical context, and as a result, better understand attitudes towards power, kinship, and family history in the medieval and early modern period. Let's go on to the next slide. 
The Linnea Antiqua is certainly of huge significance due to its source material and provenance, there's no doubt about that. It's also, of course, of major importance because of its value as a source itself. Its primary function as a compilation of Irish pedigrees and king lists can help us to understand the medieval history of Ireland, as well as early modern attitudes to the Middle Ages. In consulting the Linnea Antiqua, anyone with an interest in the pedigrees of the families of early Ireland can trace lineages from across the island. At the island. The inclusion of family trees and family crests further enhances this function. In addition to this function, however, uh, the manuscript is of huge importance because of the information available in it that cannot be found in any other manuscript. The manuscript is the only text to include pedigrees from the period between 1660 and 1700, so for the period, but O'Farrell maintains a genealogical record for them right up to the date of compilation. This is, of course, of huge significance for anybody trying to trace family history, as it closes the gap between the middle of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century. As a kind of bonus in this regard, the additions made by Sir William Betham in the 19th century attempt to continue some of these lines um, up to his time. And this brings some of the pedigrees even further up to date than the 17th century or the 18th century. Rather importantly, O'Farrell also includes the names of wives whenever possible in the Linnea Antiqua. Uh, this was practically unheard of in earlier genealogies unless a wife held a particularly high status of her own, such as Brian Baruch by Gormla. It's important to know the names of wives and mothers when possible, um, as they play an important role, as they played an important role in dynastic succession. Powerful mothers were more likely to see their sons become king, and marriage alliances often maintained unstable times of peace in the kingdoms of medieval Ireland. Wives and mothers um, often had a huge amount of political sway over their husbands and sons, and so it's really important that the Linnea Antiqua includes their names and pedigrees when possible. In doing so, the manuscript allows medievalists to better understand dynastic alliances and succession practices in the period. Can we go on to the last slide? As I've said throughout the presentation, the Linnea Antiqua is of huge importance to scholars across multiple fields, including genealogy, medieval studies, and Celtic studies. It allows us to understand both early and later genealogical history, including the forma formation of key dynastic groups, and a published transcription of the manuscript will be hugely valuable to the aforementioned fields of study. There have been calls from scholars in the past for a transcription to be prepared and published, and references in literature to the manuscript are often followed by a remark about the fact that it still remains unpublished. There are two transcriptions of the manuscript out there already, both done in the 19th century. Uh, the more famous of the two was done by Sir William Betham, uh, who made all of the additional, additional notes that I mentioned earlier on. Um, but both of these uh, transcriptions are quite outdated at this point, um, and they're both out of print now as well. As a result, they're really difficult to get, their, get your hands on, and I haven't even managed to find a copy of either yet. A lot of people with an interest in family history um, and genealogy aren't fortunate enough to have easy access to the physical manuscript in uh, the National Library here in Dublin. As a result, the text is currently um, completely inaccessible to a lot of people who would like to consult it in their own research. A new transcription, published and made available to purchase or borrow from the library, would make the contents of the Linnea Antiqua far more accessible for both scholars and ordinary people um, with an interest in family history. The NLI and to consult, to consult the text. A published edition would allow uh, researchers access to, to family trees, um, as opposed to the complex and convoluted trees that you saw um, earlier on. I find that the that reading the trees in this format makes them a lot more digestible in general, um, and as a result, they become much easier to use in my own research, and I'm sure it's the same for a lot of people. If the point of the manuscript is to preserve genealogical history for future generations to consult in their own historical research, then an accessible and easy to digest edition of the text would only serve to honor this goal, in my opinion. So that's my piece. I'll hand you back over to Luke to wrap it up, and thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hannah. That was really insightful. Um, so perhaps to conclude, I wish to return to my initial proposal. The project to transcribe Linea, Linea Antica is both ambitious as it is important. It's ambitious because it'll bring to print, to light, a mass of new material that will greatly assist with the research of clan and family history. But it is important because it contributes to a greater understanding of our shared past and helps for the type of comprehensive research that we at the Clans of Ireland both value and promote. So in the coming weeks, 
I will be writing to each member clan outlining our proposal and timeframes in detail. I'll be asking for your support to realize this project and to al allow you the opportunity to meaningfully encourage research into clan and family history. We'll be most grateful if you could please consider the proposal and of course to support the endeavor. Gormagov, we shall now be moving on to the other aspect of our Krinu today, and that is a reading of the prize winning essays. So it gives me great pleasure to now introduce one of the former winners of the Clans of Ireland essay competition, Mr. Daniel Curley. Daniel completed an MA in medieval studies at NUI Galway in 2011, and he has just completed a PhD which focuses on the elite archaeologies of the later medieval Ukalig lords of Iwana. Daniel is a manager of the Rathcrohan Visitor Centre, and he's authored a number of books and articles relating to his professional and personal academic interests. Daniel, of course, was a winner of the 2019 Chiefs and Clans Essay Competition Prize for his entry on William Bui O'Kellig and the late medieval renaissance of the Iwana Lordship, which was printed in the Clans of Ireland Anthology and was launched, which was launched, of course, last year. So without any further ado, I now invite Daniel to talk about his winning essay. Just while we're getting that ready, I referred to the anthology, so I believe there still are sales of the anthology at the back of the room, or go online to Wordwell to purchase the anthology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very interested in the, the Linnea and Tinkra um, project in and of itself, and I, I certainly will be supporting it as part of um, my professional endeavours at Rathcrohan Visitor Centre, so I'd, I'd certainly urge um, everyone else to do the same would be a valuable, a valuable addition to the public conscious. So I suppose I'm going to go through briefly what my, my essay involved. I was delighted to be um, successful in the, in the, the Kelly Lordship. So very briefly, I'm going to go through a historical background as to who the O'Kelly of Avina are, um, an indication of the, the political background, the military background, the high medieval Eastern Connacht in advance of William Bui's career, and then a brief undertaking of the multidisciplinary approaches that I've applied to his career in order to try and better understand what a, a later medieval Gaelic lord um, be engaging in, particularly an ambitious one such as William Bui. So just in terms of dating conventions, uh, particularly high medieval I refer to will be 1100 to 1350, late medieval 1350 to 1600. So the Achille of Ivina, a very prominent early medieval dynasty whose territory was broadly coextensive but what is now South is common in East Galway. So um, in the early medieval period at a particular point in time, um, we see the, the Vina uh, split into four or three different branches with uh, uh, 
an effectively semi-independent uh, territory in their midst. So we have uh, the Trihe Maimang, we have the, the Clan Crypt and the Clan Cumann, and we have the Kendall Corporate Crum. And these are the individual branches of early medieval um, Ivaina. Um, the Tir Saidon would uh, then emerge um, with the Omanians as the principal um, uh, leaders of that clan, in, in essence, of that territory. Um, the Akeli emerged as a dominant set of the Ivaina in around about the 10th century, and themselves are originating out of the Kennel Corporate Crum um, branch of the dynasty. So this area broadly south of Common from um, the end of the River Suck up to the River Hind, just south of Common Town. Uh, the most notable king of the Uvina during this period was Tvig Moro Kelly, who died in the field at Clontarf in uh, 1014 and was a very important ally to Brian Baru throughout his career. And it was a very interesting thing to note that there's ever so slight a change in political alliances that sees uh, Tvig Moro very much coming along the side of the Dal Kosh, um, which is something that wasn't seen previous to that. So, in essence, that's where we see the O'Kelly um, at around about the 11th and 12th century. However, there's considerable pressure being placed upon them, uh, particularly by their dominant northern neighbours and the former of the O'Connors of uh, Mocker Connacht, the kings of Connacht, styled as the kings of Connacht. So the Mocker Connacht is the plains of Connacht. I actually operate in my professional capacity out of Rathcrohan, Rathcrohan Crookan in the, the early medieval texts and the, the, the um, mythological and archaeological landscape of Crookan. But that's, that's the patronymy of the O'Connors. But by the 12th century, and certainly by the time we see Turlock O'Connor rising to power and uh, his very long 50-year career at the first half of the 12th century, we see O'Connor interests expanding over effectively the entirety of the province of Connacht. Uh, one indication of this is, is, is seen with the number of what uh, are described in the historical sources as castle being constructed at uh, various locations throughout Connacht um, from Athlone and Banalaslo in the east through to what is now Galway City and as far as basically Clue Bay. And these are a part of an overall, um, I suppose, seizure of power by Turlock O'Connor, and of course, it's going to have an impact on the O'Kellys. The local level, um, we see Turlock and his predecessors and descendants also engaging in a series of uh, different, I suppose, strategies. And one such strategy is the placement so the removal of some of their related kin groups out of their traditional areas in Mocker Connacht and the placement over uh, subject populations. So once instance in what is the O'Kelly patronomia lands of uh, Tirvina, uh, where we see actually the installation of the Clan Uda in the 12th century, the Clan Uda from whom emerged the O'Fallons, the O'Fallawan, and very much into the heartland of O'Kelly country. So this encroachment obviously led then to reaction, and there was a lot of tit-for-tat fighting in the 12th century, um, but it eventually led to the O'Kelly elite removing themselves from their original patrimony and migrating towards a different kingdom, a different territory, in order to retain some control. Um, the very much the better quality land, if you're going to look at it from that per perspective, would be the South West Common area, but as you cross the suck into East Galway, it becomes a bit more marginal. So they're, they're migrating into an area, to an area that was previously a semi-independent kingdom, and they turn it into Evina, in broad terms at least. So their principal locations within Evina at the end of the 12th century, early 13th century, would be the likes of Ockram in East Galway, Balnaslo, and Kilconnell. However, they weren't allowed to stay there for very long, because by the early to mid 13th century, we see the encroachment of Anglo Norman interests in Connacht more generally, and also in Tirvina and Evina. So, the map that I'm showing here are the land grants attached to various Anglo Norman barons in the middle of the 13th century. And you can see, of course, Ockram is actually a, a rural manor provided to Richard de la Rochelle in the 13th century, um, effectively evicting the O'Kelly elite in the process. So again, the O'Kelly are on the move. So for the next 50 years, you're talking about them eventually emerging back in Tirvina, their ancestral lands, under the authority of the O'Kelly, or of the O'Connor and of the Anglo-Normans. This is the environment that William Bui enters into in about 1340. Okay, so a career in dates, if we use it purely the historical and literary sources, we see William Bui arriving on the scene initially in 1340, as he kills Tyg Og O'Kelly, who was the Lord of Avina, Tyg Og only reigned for three days. Um, so you can see the uh, immediacy with which the, the, the rivals carry on is going on. William Bui would have been a legitimate rival for the kingship, and Tyg Og attempted to 
removed that rival and it, it, uh, it backfired effectively. But William Bree doesn't immediately ascend to the kingship. He doesn't seem to return to the kingship until about 1349. And at a very early point in his career, a praise poem, Chahim for a Monioch, uh, encounters at least eight successful cattle raids, um, most likely all um, actual occurrences, as well as a construction of a new court or residence feasting hall on an island site within his territory. 1351 sees him host a famous Christmas feast, which you may well be familiar with, and um, which is immortalized in Philly Air and Gwehane Jock. And this is held at his car, the stone fort site, as opposed to a castle, and gaily in Counter Common. He then founds in 1353 the Franciscan Foundation of Kilconnell, as well as the Bodoon or the cattle fort at Callow, very close by, about three kilometers to the north. Uh, 56. He attempts to, I suppose, wrest control of importance, at least, away from the O'Connor by killing one of their kings at Baladacher Loch, which again, from an archaeological perspective, does hold up evidence for later medieval uh, elite settlement. In 1368, he retires in favour of his son, Mil Shocklin, which again is not altogether in keeping with the traditional, um, I suppose, succession practices of Gaelic, the Gaelic elite throughout the period. Um, it's a primogenitor that he's employing, which is quite innovative. Uh, 1372, he still is involved in an active capacity to a degree, where he defeats the Anglo-Norman uh, de Birmingham's or Ma uh, Clan MacFearish uh, in the area around Athan Rye, which is again showing a demonstration of the expansionist and ambitious approaches that the Akeli are taking at this point in time, um, which leads them effectively to taking over territory that includes as far west as Abinach Moy. And in 1381, we see William Bree dying, a uh, reign of 32 years, which is not normal for uh, a very turbulent later medieval period for a Gaelic lord. He's eulogized as a great patron of the learned classes and he hands over his rule to his son. And together they're over 52 years in reign, which is quite an achievement in its own right. So very briefly, I'm going to go through three case study areas of basically residentials, residential areas where um, the Akeli elite in particular, William Bui seem to be uh, turning up. There are attributes that are shared across the three case studies and others besides which are too far for us to explain today. But uh, in the case of all, in effect, we have uh, a concentration of elite activity around lakeland or riverine settings. We have communication routes both over land and uh, water-based that are important to the placement of these elite centers. We've connected patronized religious houses. We have service kindred land holdings, which are very important because of their location in association with the elite residents. And we also have the archaeological investigations, which tell us in each case that up until about the 15th century, the Gaelic lords in what is O'Kelly country are residing in traditional settled form, settlement forms. They're not building tower houses at this point in time. And that is a misnomer when we break between the historical and the archaeological um, disciplines. And it's something that has to be understood. So in the case of Loch Crone, Loch Crone is um, south of Roscommon town, about 15 kilometers, and is now a turlock. It's a dried out lake, a disappeared lake. However, the settlement archaeology within is indicating a very settled elite environment for the Evina from at least as early as the 8th century. And when the Eokelis come to prominence, they only copper fasten that point of continuity, even up to the point where we have a 16th century tower house constructed at Turok. One such site was a site of excavation for my uh, investigation for my purposes, was uh, basically a blip on, on the Turlock, which actually turns out not to be natural but uh, evidence for uh, a substantial Cranog site or an artificial island site with a cashel, a stone fort, dry stone walled fort in its interior. All that's left of the stone fort is just the skeleton, the foundation stones, and the settlement activity uncovered through geophysical investigations in its interior. The artifactual assemblage that we find from illegal metal detecting um, activity at La Crone in the 1990s uncovered some very interesting features, not least this beautiful little Camplave uh, enamel mount which would have come from the same workshop as far as Griffin Murray is concerned as the Cross of Conn, which is obviously over the road here in Kildare Street. So this is part of the level of wealth and authority and prowess that's uh, undertaken in these environments. Um, so as a, an impression of what these uh, lakeland dwellings may have looked like, um, this is a recently um, commissioned reconstruction illustration of the Rock of Loch Key, which would have been the principal caput of the MacGyrmada of Moy Lurg, and the Rock of Loch Key in the 13th century has this cashel-like stone wall around its extremities, a feasting hall at the interior, and very much not in keeping what we might perceive 
um, and the first instance of Gaelic lordship. So this is what I would perceive in certain respects as what would have appeared at Loch Crone as well. The second site is the Gaelic Bay site that we referred to in Philly here in Gehenshoch, and the, the same is true. At Loch Crone, we had a service kindred, the O'Dovagons, Sean Moore O'Dovagon, a principal poet historian attached to the O'Kellys. Um, his family landholding is about three kilometers to the northwest of Loch Crone. Again, Sean Moore O'Dovagon and his family occur at the Crutch Friars at Rindoon in the late, 30, in the late 14th century. Landholding attached to the elite are evidenced through later records, but even down to the archae archaeological um, uh, focal point in and of itself at Gailey. Uh, we have the remnants of a tower house, which is again later, it's 16th century in date, with detailed uh, investigations of the natural promontory upon which Gailey Castle is placed actually indicate that there was a double set of wet ditches, um, which are now very much silted up, and one is actually used by the Crofton family as a boathouse in the 19th and uh, 20th century. Um, there's a, a ramped causeway up to the summit, and there are remnants for, again, another Cahar or Cashel for, uh, stronghold on its summit. And a reconstruction drawing commissioned as part of my PhD work indicates what William Bui's feast may have looked like in the mid 14th century. Not a castle, a Cahar or Cashel, okay? Um, just an impression of that again. And then thirdly, and most interestingly for our purposes, is the in information we have from the references in the, in the 1353 analytic records for Callow, the Bawn or Bodoon of Callow being founded and with it, the Kilconnell Franciscan Friary. The map that we see here very vividly indicates that there are actually a ring of service kindred, hereditary, hereditary service kindred land holdings uh, placed around the elite residence, as well as our religious house, its location along a very, a very major overland route where the Schlee Moor um, or the Esker Riada, basically the main Goblin, Galway Dublin road, which I drove today, um, as well as another, another number of other attributes that are consistent with elite uh, Gaelic activity. So the servant kindred land holdings in and of themselves, we see at Bally Duggan and Carton Duggan, we see the O'Dovagon poet historians yet again. We see at Bally Nabanaba, we see uh, the O'Lonergans and the O'Sheedon um, musicians in this area here. At Aina or Antenoch, we have the Mock Awards, poet historians yet again or poets. And lastly, a suggestion on my part is that at Le Carol McTully, we have the McMill Tully or the Tully physicians, all in direct attachment to the elite settlement site. So these types of things, when we look at the multidisciplinary approach, we can gather this information all in together and make some very, very uh, decent insights into what was going on. Um, again, if we look at the settlement archaeology for the period, or even the place names attached to them, we've got Listen Agree, which is the, the fort of the cattle tribute. We have Listen Akurti, which is the fort of the, the court or the, the invitation. We have the site of Callow Castle, another 16th century tower house on the site of continuity of a previous settlement. And then we have our crono on a lake land setting yet again. The archaeological field work indicates that there was actually very fine jetty features off the eastern side of the crono a rectangular stone, um, dry stone walled house hut site in the interior, which may be later, but still in all, its use through time is, in, is indicative and it's actually retained by a substantial revetment of stone on, on its extremities as well. In keeping with the Cran Oak, there's a dry land service site and that's consistent with what I believe to be the Bodoon of Callow, this very large enclosed space, which actually diverts the waters of the, the lake in order to form a, a defensive measure. And the castle, the later castle is placed in alongside that. So before and after William Bui, in the period prior to the career of William Bui O'Kelly, O'Kelly country effectively is Tirvina with some incursions into Evina. The black dots that we see here are historical references relating to individual uh, O'Kellys um, in various different locations throughout the Lordship. After William Bui's um, career, we see an entirely expanded um, Lordship. The Lordship extends as far as Abinach Moy, which is very heavily patronized by the O'Kellys, to Quinn, which is where male Shocklin O'Kelly dies and had his residence as well, William Bui's son, amongst um, the other ones that we've talked about and others besides, at League being of interest from the previous talk. So the conclusions. There are a number of things that be concluded from William Bui's career. The later medieval Gaelic elite sought to gain and retain power in their world in a variety of means. These include, but are not limited to, 
reputational building exercises, such as commissioning of the Nosa Evina, the, the feast and the poem that describes the feast at Gailey Bay. Um, we have our patronage of religious orders and foundations, such as the Kilconnell Friary at St. John's of Rindoon, at Cam, Abinach Moy, and Contusker Domani. We've got patronage of hereditary learned families, from the Odovagons, the Mac Awards, and on. We have creation or reuse of seemingly archaic or antique settlement forms. And there's an important note to make there. These antique uh, settlement forms are not because of a lack of resources or wealth. It's actually because of an, an attempt or an interest in retaining a legacy and a, and a pedigree in the past. And these are the attitudes that we need to take, because particularly when you're throwing up Franciscan priories, you certainly have the wealth to be able to build a large castle if you so wish. However, the mindset of the Gaelic elite is not of that type. Engaging in traditional societal practices like what we've referred to, feasting, a peripatetic lifestyle, which means that you've got a lord moving throughout his lordship throughout the year. You've got krika or raids, as a, as a demonstration of your wealth and prowess, an einigi, or seasonal assembly. The acquisition, retention, utilization of cattle as an important source of wealth and economic activity, something that we see in the poetic sources, the historical record, and place name survival. These approaches to kingship in later medieval Ireland do not always loom as large as the traditional historical or archaeological records, and as a result can be overlooked or misinterpreted. But multidisciplinary approaches with archaeological inquiry at its core can yield results in re reconstructing these visit less visible past environments and society. If there's questions now or wherever, if there's possible, I could just, yeah, whatever, I don't mind. Um, thanks very much. So thank you very much for that, Daniel. And uh, I think the last point's quite well made. The, it's important, the nexus between both historical record and the archeological record to develop a much more wider understanding of these um, late medieval Gaelic lordships. Thank you very much, very comprehensive and interesting paper. So now on to our second essayist, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Declan Keenan, whose winning essay for 2021 was an excellent piece of scholarship and which we highly commend. Declan has an MA in Early Modern History from University College Dublin. Declan has a keen interest in and continues to research the history and cartography of early modern Ireland. And of course, it should be noted that Declan is an avid researcher and has submitted a number of essays to our previous anthologies. And we hope will continue to do so for the future going forward. So without any further ado, I shall invite Declan up to speak about his winning essay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, indeed thrilled to have recently won the uh, Irish Chiefs and Clans Prize in History for 2021. It is a very valuable competition uh, in many respects. It encourages and facil facilitates independent scholarship like myself. And in independent scholarship can be a lonely road, so it's important to keep motivating these people, you know. And for me, on a personal level, it's very important, it's a very important part of my winter routine. So. Uh, uh, as Luke said, I have contributed over the years and uh, several times, and so indeed it is a great honour to receive the award. And that's the real value of the competition. 
uh, to keep independent scholars researching and motivated, I think. As such, I'd like to thank Fincher and Heron for facilitating the competition over the years. And indeed, I'd also like to mention uh, um, the judging panel, thank those. Uh, I know Dr. Captain Sims has been involved for many years in the competition as well. Um, just a bit of background on my paper. The title of the paper, uh, the 2021 paper, was an inauguration of a McWilliam Eafter at Rao Secura in County Mayo during the Nine Years' War. And it covered a little reported or analyzed incident that occurred there in the early stages of that war, but one which had significant consequences. The episode described in the paper occurred towards the close of December 1595 and touches on several aspects of Gaelic lordship, such as inauguration and protocol within the Gaelic and Gaelicite world, dealing with overlordship and indeed wartime diplomacy. Um, indeed, there are several le lessons from this particular episode that can be lifted into events of today. The events explored in the paper concern an inauguration of a Mac William Eichter, staged by E. Rowe O'Donnell in December 1595. The Mac William Eichter being the lineage head of the Burks and the most powerful lord in Mayo during the period. The Burke lineages in County Mayo were of Anglo-Norman de Burgo ancestry but in a period subsequent to the de Burgo civil wars became increasingly Gaelicized, adopting the customs, habits, and language of their neighboring Gaelic lineages to such an extent that by the 16th century, there was likely little difference between them and their Gaelic neighbors. Indeed, the Burks of Mayo also appear to have developed inauguration rites and procedures in a similar fashion to other Gaelic lineages and had a selected a site of antiquity to undertake these procedures. The place chosen for this rite was an ancient bivalent earthen fort at Rousekira in the barony of Kilmaine in South Mayo. And that earthen fort was perhaps part or central to a preceding reicht or lordship. Indeed, open air assembly places such as mounds and ring forts were widely used in inauguration practices and ceremonies across Gaelic Ireland. These rites were likely guided by precedent or at least influenced by protocol set at the preceding inauguration at a mi minimum. The Burks, as a Gaelicized lineage, would have had to choose a place which would have lent some antiquity to their past, and they appear to have selected one at the fort at Rousekira. Several English Crown records document a couple of Burke inaugurations at Rousekira, including the one under question. Indeed, a reference in the Annals of Connacht suggests that it was an important assembly place for the Burks as early as 1333. Therefore, it is plausible that the Burks would have elected several of their chieftains, the MacWilliam Eichter, at Rousekira between the late 14th and the close of the 16th century. Their inaugurations towards the close of the 16th century were well documented by the Crown as a result of their resurgence, the, the resurgence of Gaelic customs in Mayo. The Burks were attempting to re-establish and emphasize their customs and traditions in the wake of the turmoil, turmoil brought about by the composition of Connacht. Just to touch on the composition. The Crown administration had intended that traditional titles of chieftainship and inauguration traditions along with it were to come to an end in Connacht via the 1585 tax agreement, the composition of Connacht, which was initiated some 10 years prior to the inauguration in question. The composition served to remove the customary exactions due to the magnates, abolish traditional titles of chieftainship and signal the commencement of English law within the province. Indeed, the composition had far-reaching comp consequences for the Gaelic-sized and Gaelic septs of Mayo as it impacted upon traditional methods of succession and resulted in the abolition of that prized title, the MacWilliam Eichter. The adoption of English law in relation to succession or inheritance was significant. Under the composition, primogeniture was to replace the traditional Gaelic practice of taunistry and election, a system long since adopted by the Burks in Mayo where once the title could be contested by any senior male member from one of the leading Burke septs, under the composition, the title and associated lands, power and benefits was transferred to the eldest son of the reigning title holder at the time of the composition. Arising from the composition, many of the disaffected Burke septs revolted from the, against the crown in 1586 in response to their impoverishment. Further unrest arose in late 1588 related to the arrival of remnants of the Spanish Armada driven onto western coasts by poor weather. Some of the septs within the western baronies harbored Armada survivors, the presence of which led to open rebellion against the crown in 1589, during which the Burks once again defiantly elected a MacWilliam at Rousekira. Therefore, between the composition 
1585 and the opening of the Nine Years' War, circa 1593, many of the Burke Seps bore an ill disposition towards crown influence in Mayo. Just to touch on the Nine Years' War, to aid their cause in the Nine Years' War, E. O'Neill and E. Roe O'Donnell sought to create a confederacy of Irish lords, both Gaelic and Gaelicized. Their aims were multifaceted. Not only did they seek to form a national movement, but they also sought to relieve pressure on their own territories. To this end, both O'Neill and O'Donnell forged alliances with Gaelic chieftains such as Fee McHugh of Byrne in Wicklow, among others. But occasionally, they sought to install leaders in certain steps to ensure support. Internal disputes were often exploited by both leaders to nominate amenable candidates. And indeed, by 1595, O'Donnell had made several incursions into Lower Connacht, encompassing Mayo, and may have felt confident in his power to oversee the nomination of amenable Gaelic lords. Just to touch on the actual inauguration in 1595, the Gaelic Confederacy may have seen several advantages in re-establishing the MacWilliamship in Mayo, particularly given the various events following the composition. Although the title MacWilliam Uther had been abolished for some 10 years by this stage, it likely remained highly prized in memory. To this end, E. Rowe became directly involved in Mayo politics and set about initiating an untraditional inauguration at the traditional inauguration site, Rao Sakira, in 1595. Indeed, the inauguration is described in great detail in Baha e Ro Yudonam, written by Louis O'Clary. In the Baha description, O'Donnell appears as overlord or conqueror, holding sway over a procedure that was traditionally undertaken by what was a previously strong and independent lordship to his own. In the Baha, O'Clary describes an event that was heavily marshaled by O'Donnell's troops. The inauguration site was surrounded by four lines of O'Donnell's troops, numbering 1,800 men in total. O'Donnell's own mercenaries and troops immediately surrounded the court. Outside of them was the troops of O'Doherty and O'Boyle, whom in turn were encompassed by the McSwibneys and their Galloglass. The final ring were the men of Connacht, who were to form the fourth circle. It was from within this protected mobilisation that O'Donnell invited the lords of the territories of Mayo into the fort individually to consult with them on the MacWilliam candidate. In spite of several lords opting for the senior of the Burke lineage, as would have been the custom of the territory at the time, O'Donnell selected one Theobald MacWalter Kyotok Burke. In his description of events, O'Cleary provides a hint as to the original nature and protocol of the inauguration of the Burks. It was by consultation among these and by election that a chieftain used to be inaugurated over the country. However, it is clear that O'Donnell had sidestepped that tradition of the Burke inauguration. Given the military might present, and their deployment about the site, there was to be no second guessing his decision. As described above, the fourth ring around the Rath was the men of Connacht, i.e. the traditional electors and claimants, potentially limiting the access of the Burke and contestants to the proceedings. It was probable that there was little option but to proclaim Theobald MacWalter Kyotok as chieftain. Furthermore, it is conceivable that the selection may have been prearranged. Needless to say, O'Donnell's marshalling of a long-standing right within a traditionally independent or lordship was met with considerable and immediate opposition. Many SEPs considered there were more deserving candidates among their own. But there were perhaps several reasons as to why O'Donnell supported the suit of Theobald MacWalter Kyotok and may have provided the Confederacy with several advantages if the appointment held. Indeed, Theobald's power base and lands were in the barony of Tyrolli, centred at the castle of Tlaib. Leak. These lands in the northeast of the lordship bordered the lands of Sligo, an area where O'Donnell claimed rights of overlordship. As such, Theobald's centre of power may have provided a bridgehead for the Confederacy over the River Moy into the territories of Mayo. Despite having effectively seized the chieftaincy, Theobald had a considerable pedigree in claiming that position. Theobald was a leading scion of the Schlucht Rickard Burks. His grandfather, Sir John, and granduncle Richard Fitzolivus had held the MacWilliamship in preceding decades. In addition, Theobald had been imprisoned in Athlone Castle as a young man by the Crown in 1593. Considering O'Donnell's own treatment and imprisonment as a, as, a, as a youth at the hands of the Crown, it may not have been as surprising that O'Donnell felt compelled to support the suit of Theobald. A brief description of the inauguration is also provided in the Annals of the Four Masters. The annals also indicates the summons of O'Donnell to Rausakira and his selection of Theobald 
based on his being the first to come over to him and as he was in the bloom of his youth. Almost immediately, the appointment backfired on O'Donnell. Indeed, he had travelled back to Tir Connell with several of Theobald's competitors as hostages. Although Theobald had a reasonable pedigree, O'Donnell had selected one of the most least eligible in the accords with the custom of the Burks of the Territories, on account of his age mainly. Despite O'Donnell's attempts to potentially secure the territories of Mayo, Theobald was never to gain great popular support from within the Burke Steps over the course of the war. In fact, the affair of Rousekir merely served to bolster an almost constant opposition to O'Donnell's MacWilliam and eventually diminished the status of the MacWilliamship. So on the impacts, in the short term, O'Donnell had effectively alienated the larger portion of the Burke Seps and the Gaelic Confederacy and pushed them into making a choice between the government of the English crown or, or the overlordship of O'Donnell via an unpopular MacWilliam. It was a significant deficit for the Confederacy as there was a loss of access to many fighting men within the Burke territories who may have been once willing adherents, including one of its most effective leaders, Theobald Nilung, or Theobald of the ships. Theobald Nilung was a, man's of mean, means of a, a man of means and ability by both land and sea. He was the son of Gráinne Niwalia and Richard O'Neillian Burke, a former MacWilliam Meifter. He was pushed beyond the reach of the Confederacy. He had reportedly access to three galleys and a mini navy comprising of a hundreds, which was a rarity in Gaelic Ireland. Theobald Nilung took it upon himself to drive MacWilliam out of Mayo upon his every incursion. As such, MacWilliam retained a weak position, met rarely with success, and was continually propped by hundreds of O'Donnell's own men over the course of the war. Each MacWilliam incursion into Mayo was met with a swift retaliation, and several times MacWilliam was driven back to, to Tyrconnell, only to be reinforced and sent back. O'Donnell continually made use of Mayo as a decoy situation to divert Crown attention from other locations. Generally, most of the Burke Seps objected to the continual exploitation and depletion of their lands and livestock which, and had come to see themselves as sacrifices to the Confederacy strategy. At this stage, Mayo was generally under the control of Theobald Nilong. Ultimately, the nomination could be described as a st strategic misjudgment and only served to reduce O'Donnell's influence in Mayo as the war progressed. Furthermore, his selected MacWilliam was not a strong military leader as his sponsor. The entire lordship, which was originally disaffected with Crown government, could have possibly fallen into O'Donnell's hands with greater ease had a more sensitive selection taken place. However, this was not to be. The matter also possibly deprived the Northern Confederacy of access to additional fighting men within the Burke territories, some of whom opposed O'Neill and O'Donnell at the Battle of Kinsale under the leadership of Theobald Nilong. Moreover, the policy may have deprived the Northern Confederacy of potential safe Anchorage locations within the Burke territories, some of which may have been more suited. The Northern Confederacy, with some additional advantages, had a more amenable approach and adopted Rav Sakira. In literature on the Nine Years' War, the 1595 inauguration of Rousekeeper tends to be understated and indeed forgotten. As for o O'Donnell's MacWilliam, he, like O'Donnell, in spite of later intrigues with Captain Thomas Lee, travelled to Spain, arriving in July 1603. MacWilliam died in Spain in 1604, never to return to his patrimony. However, MacWilliam's son, Don Balthazar, or Walter, was knighted by Philip III of Spain as the Knight of Santiago in 1607. Interestingly, there is a record of decree confirming the Spanish title, Marcus de Mayo, with Balthazar de Burgo MacWilliam Burke on the 21st of July, 1627. Overall, it's a, an interesting episode, and I suppose there's a few key lessons in it. The inhabitants, inhabitants of lordships tend to be very attached to their customs, rights, and protocols. And you can't just march in and usurp. There, there needs to be a sensitive approach and um, there's, uh, any insensitivity can result in almost universal opposition. I think there's still many lessons in this uh, little sub-chapter, even for more current circumstances. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for that. Declan, excellent paper and very interesting, particularly the description of the 1595 inauguration from particularly from O'Cleary's uh, perspective. And I note, if we look across your research, you have quite a lot of different diverse papers which you have written. So um, again, hopefully in the future, we'll see more of those, perhaps one on the, on the Keenans themselves. <laughs> so without any further ado, perhaps we may present you with the cup as a sign of our sincere thanks for your efforts. Please. So now I'd like to invite up uh, Michael, our MC for today, who will notify us about the next item.
Testing. So up about there, yeah. Hello, hello, hello.
chair, I wonder. Right. I'm plugged in there now. We're not working. Yeah, we're not working. Thank you, Michael. 
So I wish to introduce our first speaker who has a fascinating talk in store for us, which will focus on the 1766 religious census of Ireland and the digitization of sources and resources for historical research. Dr. Brian Guren is an expert in the history and evolution of census taking in Ireland. He has written on the subject of Irish censuses and on Irish demography, and is especially interested in census sources and pre-census sources for the period before the Irish famine. The religious census of 1766 and the first statutory censuses of 1813 to 1815 are of particular interest to him and his research. In 2022, a volume of Irish demographic statistics from the 1764, 65 and 1766 religious censuses will be published by the Irish Manuscripts Commission and uh, co-authored by Brian himself. So without any further ado, I invite Brian to the le lectern. Thank you. We good? Good. Um, that volume was actually published about uh, three weeks ago. So the 1766 Religious Census volume. Um, okay, has anyone ever heard of the Religious Census of 1766? Any? No? <laughs> okay, right. Um, let us, let's get going. So Irish public records were held in various buildings and repositories around Dublin and throughout the country before the 1860s. Many of these repositories were unsuitable for storing fragile documents and records were often found to have been damaged by damp, by rodent infestation, and most worrisomely by fire. The public record office was deemed necessary to ensure the protection, the preservation, and the survival of the records of Ireland and under the Public Record Office of Ireland Act 1867, one was opened in the northwest corner of the Forecourts complex with the office handed over to the deputy keeper of the records of Ireland, Samuel Ferguson, on the 19th of November, 1867. Now there's just a, a, a sample of some of the records that were uh, contained in the Public Record Office. The census returns from the first five statutory censuses were in there from 1813 to 1851. Uh, the censuses from 1861 to 91, the four of those were destroyed uh, by government order. State papers were in there. Parliamentary records, including the 1766 religious census. County records. Um, a, a count, county accounts, administration uh, records and grand jury records, uh, corporation records uh, for towns, um, maps, the down survey maps and so on, uh, wills, parish registers of the established church, the Church of Ireland uh, came in after in, in the 1870s, uh, uh, tax records like the poll tax and the hearth tax and so on. So there's a vast collection of records. And as you may or may not know, the building was destroyed on the 30th of June, 1922, and almost all the records were lost. Now, the Public Record Office consisted of two separate buildings. So you can see uh, part of the Record Office here. The building on the left, the squarish looking building, the smaller of the two was called the Record House. And that was, that was the building that was accessible to the public. Um, so if you wanted to research the records, you went into the record house in through that front door there on the left. Um, it contained a reading room for researchers, uh, the strong room where records were temporarily retained uh, for researchers if they were working on them and they were going to return back the next day, they were maintained in the strong room. And some magnificent indexes which facilitated the researchers in identifying the records that they wished to examine. The second building then, the larger of the two, the one on the right, uh, uh, larger, higher, was called the Record Treasury. And that was so called because it would contain the treasures of Ireland, magnificent records and collections which documented 800 years of Ireland's history. The Treasury was designed with one long aisle running through the middle of the building with 10 letter lettered bays on both sides of the aisle. So bays were identified by letters. On the east side, it was letters A to K. 
and on the left side, letters L to U on the west. Um, just to give you a quick look, that's the record house. So that's where the researchers sat. Um, so you'd go in and you'd sit in the desks there, on the, in the desks at the, at the far end, and then you'd hand up your documents to the clerk, and then they'd go through those double doors on the right-hand side, which would bring them into the record treasury where they'd fetch the records and bring them back into the record, into the record uh, house for you. And then that's a view inside the record treasury. So that's the aisle running down the middle of it. And on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you had the bays. There, as I said, there were 10 bays along the, along the east side of the building and 10 bays along the west side. So that's 20 bays per floor. And the building was six stories high, uh, excluding the basement, which had a different arrangement. So the entire treasury then contained 120 individual bays. And an individual bay was identified by a simple number and letter combination representing the floor number and the bay letter. At the end of, is that, is that visible? I'm not quite sure that it is. Uh, at the end of 1894, so that's this, this is showing the organization, this chart is showing the organization of the records. This was in the deputy keeper's report. They published their, an annual report every year, and this is showing the locations of the records uh, in each of the individual bays. So, for example, at that stage, the census records in red there, in the red box, were up on the top floor, on floor six, in bays I and K. Uh, so that's in two bays, uh, holding the census records from 1821 to 1841. And on the other side of the aisle, uh, in bays M and L, there were the, the, remains of the, the remainder of the census records, 1841 and 1851. In the bays, there were numbered shelves, and on the shelves, there were uh, the numbered items, the individual items and the individual record sets. So any single record could be pinpointed by simply providing the bay, the shelf, and the subnumber of the item. For example, collector's accounts were in bay 6E, so you can see there, bay 6E, it's giving collector's accounts. So we might remember that one just now for, the, for the, the, the future. Now over the next number of years, and that's the west side of the, of the bay. So you can see census records on 6L and 6M, as I said, so up there on the top left, there are census records. And I've circled that 50 because that's the parliamentary collection, because that's where the 1766 religious census returns were. Now, over the next number of years, the Public Record Office received into its custody the collections of records, which had been lodged in various repositories, such as the Custom House in Dublin, the Record Tower in Dublin Castle, that contained state papers, and the records of the, the defunct Irish Parliament, which included my 1766 religious censuses. The Church of Ireland parish registers after this establishment because they were declared as public records, wills and testamentary records, taxation records such as the heart tax, and later following a catastrophic fire in the courthouse in Cork City in 1891 when the records of Cork City were, Cork City were destroyed, the records that were stored in county archives and offices around the country were also taken into the record office. And how did they do it? Well, what they did was they went out to the archive that was to be transferred into the record office, and they'd go out and they'd, ex they'd examine the archive and measure up to see uh, how much space the records were going to take. Then they'd come back to, their, back to the record office, and they'd lay out the shelves, organize the shelves as per the arrangement of the records in the archive, and then they'd go out. So each of the bays were differently arranged in terms of the number of shelves and, and so on. And then they'd, they'd, they'd set up the, the, the bay to receive the records and then they'd transfer over the records. So, so basically what they did was they reconstructed the individual archives in the PRO as they moved, as they moved the archives across. Now, the greatest measures were taken to ensure uh, the security and preservation of the records. This is all very ironic considering the, the end result in the, of, of the PRO. 
So they wanted to ensure the safety and preservation of the records in the archive. The record treasury was not accessible to the general public as we know. At the outset, they had used wooden shelves in the initial years, but that was, that was later determined that the wooden shelves were employed in a manner most favorable to, to combustion. So they were gradually replaced by iron shelves to reduce the possibility of damage by fire. And we can follow these improvements through the reports of the deputy keeper published annually from 1869. In, in his 11th report in 1879, the deputy keeper noted that galvanized iron shelving was thereafter to be used. And he also expressed his hope that hereafter from time to time to eliminate the existing wooden shelving from the central and southern sections, as well as the wooden flooring from the galleries of communication so that there shall be nothing inflammable within the building except the records themselves. And these I may observe would be extremely difficult of combustion. So they try to exclude as much wood as possible out of the record treasury to ensure the pre preservation of the, of the records. And by 1892, about 25 years after the archive had opened, no wooden shelving remained and the records were, it was thought, as perfectly preserved from fire as was possible. Furthermore, fire prevention measures had been built into the design of the office at the outset. As we said, the, the building, can, can, the, the, the record office, the public record office consisted of two separate buildings. Uh, and the first deputy keeper's report noted that although externally the record house and treasury appear to constitute one block, so it looks as if it's one building there, one block of buildings of uniform design, but the treasury, which stands considerably higher than the house, is separated from it by an open area 10 feet wide, ac wide across which is thrown a covered bridge closed by iron doors at each end, forming the principal means of communication between the two edifices. It is heated by warm water pipes from furnaces in the basement of the record house and may be considered effectually isolated as regards any risk of fire from the official part of the building. So that arrow is pointing at the, the fire break between the two buildings. So that there is the 10 feet gap between the treasury and the record house. And that was to ensure that the record house had fires in it for the, to keep the public warm because this is where the public were, were working. So these had fires. So this fire break was to ensure that if a fire happened to break out in the record house, the treasury was going to be, the records in the treasury was going to be, were going to be preserved. And all that would be sacrificed was whatever records were in there that people were working on at the time. And ironically enough, in the end, the fire break operated in the opposite direction because this is the building that was destroyed and this building survived. So the fire break operated to preserve the record house from the fire in the record treasury instead of the other way around. There were no open fires in the treasury, so the only threat to the, off to the, to the office was from fire. So the only threat to the office from fire, it was considered involved a fire occurring in the record house and the 10 foot fire wide fire break would preserve the fire from spreading from the house to the treasury. Now there's what you would have filled out if you went into the record office, that's a, an inspection docket. It was filled out on the 26th of February, 1918, and it is for collector's accounts, right? And that's the, the code or the location for the collector's accounts for Londonderry for 1690. It was in Bay 6E uh, on shelf three, and it was item number four on the shelf. So if you went into Bay 6E, you would have seen the shelves on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. You would have gone down to the third shelf and taken the fourth item off it, and you would have gotten your collector's accounts for Londonderry. And if we just quickly scroll back here, remember our collector's accounts that we said? They're 6E, so that's where, that's where they were. And that document, if you see a signature, can anyone read it? Tennyson Groves, T. Groves. Anybody come across Tennyson Groves? He's a great, great, uh, great hero of mine. 
That's Tennyson Groves. We'll get, to him. we'll get to him coming up shortly. He was a genealogist around working in the record office around the 1900s and 1910s. And uh, because of him, it's because of him that I'm giving this talk, because if it wasn't for Tennyson Groves, there'd be very little of the religious census surviving. Now, as, as we said, the archive contained the complete census returns from Ireland's first five statutory censuses. Uh, the first five statutory censuses that were held in Ireland. They were 1813 to 1815, which was the first Irish statutory census. It didn't successfully enumerate Ireland. So another census was held in 1821, and thereafter censuses were held every 10 years, every decade. 1821 was the first census to be successfully completed. Um, it recorded the names of everybody living in the country. 6.8 million people. That was, they were contained in 480 volumes of census returns that were in the archive. Um, and then 1813, 1841 was the first Irish census to be held on a particular day. That was census day, 6th of June, 1841. Uh, and 1851, which was the first Irish census after the famine. So comparisons between 1841 and 1851 gave an indication of what had happened and the, the demographic catastrophe that the famine was. It is worth noting that the census returns from 1861, 71, 81, and 91 were deliberately destroyed by government instructions, and they were never moved or located in the public record office. The deliberate destruction of censuses is not particularly surprising given the attitudes towards the records at the time. And it's an indication of how research priorities have changed over the past 150 years when we see the first deputy keepers uh, report, that's uh, Samuel Ferguson was the first deputy keeper, appealing that no more census records be sent to the public record office for storage. This is what he said. The population returns are very bulky and with the sequel of the census of 1831 and 1834 and of the several decennial censuses and agricultural returns to 1859 inclusive now occupying more than one half of the entire basement of the record treasury. Altogether they weigh not less than 60 tons and it is difficult to see how provision has been made for the reception of this class of papers in the future as there now remains only a few bays in the basement which can be so allocated, and it would be a misapplication of the costly fittings of the upper treasury to occupy them with such matter, to occupy them with such matter, even if the requirements of legitimate record accommodation should leave any part of these fillings, fittings unoccupied. Now, we said at the start that the census records were held on floor six, but here he's talking about them in the basement. That was because when they came in uh, initially from the custom house and from the record tower in Dublin Castle, they were moved to the basement and they remained in the basement because Samuel Ferguson had such a disparaging attitude towards the census. So they remained in the basement until Ferguson was replaced as deputy keeper. And once he was replaced as deputy keeper, immediately the next de deputy keep keeper, Diggs Latouche, moved him right up to the top floor. But Ferguson had a really disparaging uh, um, um, attitude towards the sense of seeing them just as clutter, like he describes in there and that as it would be a misapplication of the costly fittings to occupy them with such matter. So it's quite amazing to see that in the 1860s and in the 1870s, the census records were been looked down upon, and now they're one of the most popular records for, 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 for uh, uh, researchers in, in, the, in the National Archives, uh, if they, in, in cases where they survive. Now, so they're the, they're the statutory censuses, and although the first statutory census, as we saw, didn't commence in Ireland until 1813, a remarkable census was held about a half a century previously in 1766. In that year, the House of Lords resolved that the several archbishops and bishops of this kingdom shall be and are hereby desired to direct the parish ministers in their respective dioceses to return a list of the several families in their parishes to this house on the first Monday after the recess, distinguishing which are Protestants and which are Papists, and also a list of the several reputed Popish priests and friars residing in their parishes. So that was a resolution of the House of Lords. 
They were directing the bishops and the archbishops of the Church of Ireland, because that was the established church, that was the official state church, to get their ministers to return lists of names of their parishioners, the people living in their parishes, including Catholics and Protestants, and uh, all, all religions, dissenters as well, to return a list of the several families, so a list of the householders with the religion indicated and the list of priests and friars. And the first Monday after recess was the 5th of May, 1766. Now this resolution of the Lords was passed on the 5th of March, 1766. So that gave them two months to, pr to prepare their censuses and get them into the House of Lords. And this marked the commencement of the 1766 religious census of Ireland on the 5th of March, 1766. Now those instructions seem, seem clear enough. They were requesting a list of families, that's the names of the householders, with the religion of each, each householder indicated. Now in 1766, the population of Ireland can't have, been, can't have exceeded 3 million, with probably about 2.75 million people. And given that the mean household size at the time, the size of a household was about five, then if this census was successful, lists of names totaling about 550,000 names should have been received at the House of Lords. So there should have been a, a list coming in from individual parishes and they should have totaled up to well over half a million names. The end result, however, fell well short of that target. Some ministers completely ignored it, ignored the order and made no returns at all. So some parishes just didn't respond. Some ministers did not provide a list of householders' names, but they merely returned the number of Protestant and Catholic families in their, in their in their parishes. So they'd send in a return uh, saying, in my parish there is X number of Protestants, X, Y number of Catholics, and that was it. Some of them even, when they got the order, they flipped it over and wrote it on the back and sent back in the order back with just those, those, those brief notes on it. Some ministers went a little further, returning numbers to town and level, but still failed to return a list of the names. But many ministers, albeit probably a minority, complied, providing a full list of parishioners in their parish, parishes. And some of these lists were, were, were quite extensive, like there'd be a thousand names or, or, or so. One parish that I know of in Waterford returned over 6,000 names. Okay, so even writing a thousand names is going. These were this was a considerable effort that that the the, the uh, a considerable task that the um, that the lords and the, the archbishops and the bishops were putting on their clergymen, which for which they weren't paid. So many some many ministers complied, providing their list of names, and some ministers exceeded the terms of the lords' resolution. In some cases, by quite a considerable degree. Now, I'm going to show you on the next slide, I'm going to show you a map that I'm working on at the moment, but it's only partially complete, but it will give an indication uh, for the northern part of the country of what we have, right? Now, so it's only partially complete, and what it is showing is the dark red colour there, okay? So you can see up around Donegal, it's almost all dark red, uh, West Tyrone and uh, East Galway. Um, Leitrim, places like that, down through Monon, they're all dark red. They're parishes that returned numbers only. So those guys were failing to comply with the resolution of the House of Lords. They were just giving brief uh, 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 numbers. But the green, the dark green, are parishes that returned the list of names. So that was hitting the requirement or exceeding the requirement of, of, of the, the House of Lords. So they were returning lists of names. And you can't really see it on this map, but up around there, up around Armagh and Tyrone, you can see little yellow spots possibly. Uh, you might not, it probably won't be clear to you, but some of those have, have little spots and down around Tipperary here have little black spots uh, as well. They are original returns that survived. The original records from these, like we're really, really lucky in that the 1766 census, it's the only part of the entire parliamentary records that were in the public record office that survive. Okay, so we have original returns from these, from a small number of parishes around the country. So this is, this is really exciting for uh, the Beyond 2022 project. So, 
if, the, if everybody had complied, of course, the map should be entirely dark green, but it's not. You can see that there are very large sections uh, of the country which, which fail to return uh, lists of names. Uh, it may appear from this map that the majority of ministers fail to meet the terms of the requirement because there's far more dark red on it than dark green. But by the time I finish it, by the time I get that down and finish off in the southern, southern diocese down around Cork and Ross and Limerick and uh, Cashel and Emily and Ossery uh, and Waterford and this more, there's plenty of dioceses still to go, there's plenty of work to be done on it. By the time I get it finished, the, the results will be closer, a little bit closer to 50-50. It'll probably still be the case that a majority of ministers didn't return names, but it's going to be a bit closer to 50-50 because the provision of lists of names predominated in the southern diocese. Now, since this census was initiated by Parliament, the returns were stored with the records of the Irish Parliament, and they were transferred to the Public Record Office in the 1870s to be lodged in Bay 5-0. Because many of the returns contained lists of names, along with denominational allegiances, these returns proved particularly appealing to genealogists at the opening of the 20th century. And many of the returns were transcribed either in part or in full uh, at that time. Notable genealogists who extracted information from the 1766 returns were Tennyson Groves. Have you ever heard of him? He's our He's our collector's accounts for Londonderry. So Tennyson Groves, he was a, an Armagh man, and he focused his attention on the parishes in the, diocese, in, the, in the northern diocese of Armagh, Derry, Dromore, Down and Connor, and Raffoe. So he extracted uh, surviving information from the 1766 census for, for those northern dioceses. And because of that, we have the, the, the record or the transcriptions of, of those returns, of many of those returns survive. Uh, Bartholomew O'Keefe, a priest uh, from uh, Cloyne, transcribed the complete set of the, the returns for Cloyne Diocese, that's down here, which I haven't got to mapping yet. So the entire, even though the originals have been lost, a, a full transcript of Cloyne survives as well. Uh, William Carrigan, uh, another priest, was interested in Ossery. Um, Michael Comerford was interested in Kildare and Lachlan and extracted uh, information from that. And Philip Crossley focused on uh, the, uh, the tomb arch, uh, Archbishop Rick, principally the Diocese of Elphin, Kalala and Connery and Killaloo. In some cases, they transferred the censuses completely and in other cases, they extracted numerical abstra uh, abstracts. And let's just have a look at some of them. This is Tennyson Groves transcribing the returns for Carlingford Parish in 1766, uh, and he, he he it's a list of families in the parish of uh, a list of families in the parish of Carlingford compiled on the 29th of May 1766 by Paul Twig, vicar of Carlingford, and these are the lists these are the lists of names survives completely. It's not the original; it's Tennyson Groves transcript. And we're very lucky to have this. So if you were a genealogist with an interest in Carlingford, this would be a fantastic source for you. This is uh, Bartholomew O'Keefe, who was focused on Cloyne. This is his return for um, uh, Tully Lease Union down in County Cork. In this case, this is the complete return. This is the return that was there. So in this case, there's no list of names. This is just a minister who returned numbers only. But again, it survives uh, as, a, as an excellent transcript. And here's a snippet of Philip Crossley's uh, extract for Temple Boy in County Sligo, providing list of names here. So he, this minister provided a list of names, but also giving the number of people in the house. So this was not a requirement of the House of Lords. So this minister went beyond the terms of the, of the Lord's resolution. What's most exciting about the about the surviving information from the 1766, however, is that 59 original items uh, survive from it, original returns that were received from the ministers. And many of these original survivors are truly magnificent. So here's some of them. This is a wonderful return for Calicial County Tyrone. Again, it didn't return the names. So that's one of my red uh, parishes on the map. It's for Calicial 
and the Diocese of Armagh are County Tyrone, so he gives the known to be what they really are, the spawn of Scottish Covenanters, avowed enemies to all civil and religious establishment, and the most virulent and ferocious persecutors of the established church during the late tumult in the north of Ireland. Many of these ministers, these, these ministers were living in quite remote areas, many of these, and this is their first ever opportunity that, they were, that they've ever had to communicate with, with officialdom in Dublin, and boy, are they taking advantage of it. So this guy is, he knows that he's never going to get to speak to Dublin again, so he's taking uh, uh, the, the full opportunity that he had. This is a return for Count Loud Parish in County Louth, and this is a fascinating one. I didn't transcribe it, but what, it, what he says, the above list, and again, he only provides numbers. He didn't provide names for, for, for this minister. The above list was made by persons the best qualified to make it, and I do believe it to be done with as much care and exactness as the time would allow. I need not observe this return considered as a ground for computation that there is not in the in the families returned as popish, one single Protestant. So in the Catholic, Catholic families, there's no Protestant at all. Uh, returned as one single Protestant, nor is there one family returned as Protestant. So that's of the 14 Protestant families. No, not even the parish ministers in which there are not papists. It is so general, it is so general a case. I cannot find that there are yeah, so what he's saying is that they're the Protestant, they're the Catholic families, 725 Catholic families, and there's not a single Protestant in them. But in the 14 Protestant families, there are Catholics. They were in there as typically as servants, but sometimes as household members as well. And that was that was quite common. Any of the returns that contain religious breakdowns within families will often show that Protestant families had Catholic members at the time, but Catholic families didn't have Protestant members. Um Here's a magnificent return for Ratbury County Cork, an original return. So this is an original survivor. And in this case, he provides the list of names in this. So that was the terms of the, of the Lord's resolution. But he also gives, this is the, so this is James Mead. And then he's giving the number of Protestants in his house and the number of Catholics in the total. So James Mead would have been recorded as a Protestant householder but his house had three Protestants and four Catholics. Richard O'Donovan's house had two Protestants and four Catholics as well. So it, that's providing much more information that the, 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 than, than that the House of Lords had asked for. So that's a wonderful return. And you can see water damage on it here as well, which is lovely to see. Great to see something like this surviving. This is a return for Athassel Union in County Tipperary. It's again, an original return providing the list of names and beautiful writing. Uh, and in this case, they're providing religious breakdown by sex. So he's even going further than, than, than the Rat Barry return. So he's giving the number of Protestant males. So Oliver Latham's house had three Protestant males, three Protestant females, four Popish males, and two Popish females. So of the 12 people in Oliver Latham's house, uh, six were Protestants, six were Catholics. So they're giving sex breakdown and religious breakdown. So that's getting, getting even better. And this is the most magnificent surviving return. It's the jewel in the crown of the 1766 returns for a parish called Newcastle in County Tipperary. This must have represented the, the invention of the Excel spreadsheet. List of names, details, the number of children, ma uh, males un above, sons above 14, sons under 14, daughters above 14, daughters under 14, men servants, maid servants, men relations, friends or lodgers, women relations, friends or lodgers, number of Protestants, number of papists, total number of souls and the number of the house. So 14 different columns. So to get that information, he was only asked to provide a list of names, and he went out and he he went out around from house to house to get this information. And he does say at the end, I didn't put it in there. He does put in a little note saying, "I found it really difficult to get the information from Catholic houses because there was a rumor around that our children were going to be taken off us." So they they didn't know what the what the survey was about. So this rumor got around, and people were were denying the denying the information. Now, so that's the that's Newcastle County Tipperary. It's the most beautiful of the of the, and the most informative of the uh, uh, surviving 
uh, originals. In some cases, we have original seals like this. So this is the postal stamp, and that's the seal of the minister who sent it in. It's from Calicial County, Tyrone, which we saw earlier. Stamped, postal stamp, 2nd of April, uh, 1766, when it was posted from Armagh, and that's the, the minister's seal. So it's really lovely to see something like that when you have the seal still present or the postal date. And just to conclude now, because I've gone a little bit over time, with two interesting stories. Um, that's the 1766 envelope for the, that contained the return for Lockgall County Armagh. You can see there, the census return was addressed to Henry Baker Stern on the 28th of April, 1766. That's this, 28th April. And it's posted from that top one up there, that top writing up there says Armagh. It's posted from Armagh. And that's the name, Henry Baker Stern, Esquire, Clerk of the House, Clerk of the Right Honourable House of Lords. So that was uh, Dublin. That was all the address was, okay? Addressed to Henry Baker Stern on the 28th of April. There's the Dublin Courier of the 25th of April, 1766, three days before the letter was posted, died a few days ago on his way to Bath, Henry Baker Stern, Clerk of the House of Lords. So by the time the Lockgall census was posted, Henry Baker, to Henry Baker Stern, he was dead about a week at that stage. So the, the Baker Stern, just by pure coincidence, died in the middle of the census. So all these census returns were pouring into the House of Lords when the clerk was dead. So they were being addressed to a dead person. And this is, this is uh, the most tragic thing of all uh, is that the PRO, as we know, was destroyed on the 30th of June, 1922. So this is the record treasury. It's absolutely wrecked. It was built with such, uh, with su such enthusiasm, with such, with, with such determination that the records would be preserved. And the, the record office was so thorough in, in how they went about their job. If we look at the census again, if we look at the 1821 census, they didn't just take in the 1821 census into the record office. The act that specified that the 1821 census be taken also said that the individual counties were to make copies of the census, right? So they were to have their own copy in local custody. And after the burning of the court courthouse in 1891, the county records had to come in. So all those copies of the 1821 census came in as well. So it wasn't just that the 1821 census was destroyed, by pure fluke, the copies of the 1821 census were destroyed as well. So it's a really real, real tragedy. And what we are trying to do, as you know, with the Beyond 2020-22 uh, project is just to recover some bits of that, that archive for future generations. So thank you for your, your interest. And, uh, This is, the, this, is the, this is the Irish House of Lords. Ireland had its own parliament from the, ooh, the 12th century up until um, 1800. It closed in 1800. And Ireland became part of the United Kingdom on the 1st of January, 1801. So there was a parliament. If you uh, are in Dublin, and if you walk down this direction here, if you come out, you turn right, go down to Grafton Street and turn right and just go right down to Grafton Street, you'll hit Trinity College, you'll find Trinity College on your left hand, on your right hand side, and the building opposite, a magnificent rounded uh, building is, the, is the, uh, the old Irish House of Parliament. It's now the Bank of Ireland, uh, but that is where the Irish Parliament sat up until, uh, up until it closed its doors, and I think it was August uh, uh, 1800, uh, and then Ireland, uh, Ireland became part of the, the United Kingdom on the 1st of January 1801. So it was the, the Irish Parliament, all right, uh, not the, and the Irish House of Lords that instructed that the 1766 census be taken. Yeah, good. Brian, thank you very much for that. Really insightful and certainly detailed. And I think I share everyone else's thoughts here. Such a lamentable situation that many of the records, of course, were destroyed in 1922, as you outlined. 
But also, it's heartening to know that um, some of these are being reconstructed through the Beyond 22 project. So um, just to flag that for people to, um, to look out for that project, which will be going online from mid, mid this year, as I understand it. So I think um, maybe at this juncture, it's worthwhile perhaps drilling down on some of the um, issues which you, which you have raised. I suppose that the first thing which comes to mind is what does the 1766 religious census tell us fundamentally about Ireland in the mid 18th century? That's a, that's a good question. It, it tells us so much. It gives us a, an indication of uh, Irish population levels uh, at, at a local level um, well before, 55 years before the first census was conducted and uh, almost 60 years before the first su successful census was conducted. Um, it gives us, it gives, depending on what survives, it can give us indications of um, uh, interdenominational relations. You can get, come across comments like uh, the Calicial comment there about the, the Spanish St Scottish Covenanters. There are very many comments like that coming through about uh, about usually this. It, it's typically quite disparaging comments on uh, Protestant dissenters or Catholics. Um, but there's the vast amount of information that that's available in there. And then in terms of genealogy, if if you are a genealogist and uh, a 1766 return survives for your parish, you're you're in a really really great place because th these are fantastic. If they're well conducted, uh, these are very very useful uh, genealogical resources, and that is why so much survives from it because it proved so interesting and so useful to, to, to genealogists that that's, that's why the genealogists like Groves, like Crossley, like Bartholomew O'Keefe went out and transcribed so much information from it because the, these, as records, these, these are unparalleled records and this was really a, a, a fantastic and a wonderful census survey uh, to, to have. And it, it, it's a tragedy that so much of it was lost because quite because that map that I was showing was showing the coverage from it, not the survival rate from it. So that is important to note that just because you see a parish indicated there in red or green, it doesn't mean that the returns survive for it. There's an awful lot of was lost from it. But the really important thing is that an awful lot survives from it too. And what we do hope to do with Beyond 2022 is to make as much of that available to researchers as possible. Great, indeed. Thank you for that. And that, actually, that segues nicely into the next question, which is how much can we realistically expect to recover from the 1766 census? And how much of that will be useful from a genealogical point of view? And how much will be useful from a more macro demographic perspective of the country? Yes, indeed. Um, we have a, a, a kind of a, a ballpark target with Beyond 2022. What we're trying to do is we're trying to re we're, we're trying to target about a thirty percent recovery of the records within the public record office. Now it's not that's not thirty percent of the entire records. It's thirty percent of the the key records like like uh, um, taxation returns and fiat, fiats and and uh, um, uh, patent rolls and so on. So that's the 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 kind of ballpark target that we're we're, we're talking about. But with the seventeen sixty six census. It's it's somewhat unique in 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 in, in this uh, in this uh, project because firstly we have the original returns, fifty nine original items surviving from it, which is really really good, and you've seen some of those there now. But also uh, because of the the transcription, the interest that 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 genealogists had in it, we and and the fact that so much of the map appears in red that initially when we started out we thought that well if we only have numbers. Well, then that means that that's just an abstract of the original return, that the, the list of names was lost. But it was only afterwards that we realized that actually many of the parishes only return numbers anyway. So the numbers that survive represent the complete survival of a parish rather than just an abstract of the parish. So we're now working on the assumption, and I think fairly solid assumption, that we're going to be able to recover about 50% of the 1766 religious census in terms of what it was at the time in, in, on, on the 30th of June uh, 1922. So this is way beyond our, our wildest expectations. And how this came about, I'll tell you an inter if I have the time, if I have the time. How this came about was really interesting. 
Um, like I've been working on, on with 1766 and on 1766 researching for many years. And it was quite frustrating in that, you know, we had good returns and we knew about the survival rate from, from some areas, but we never had the, the full picture of how many ministers responded. And when I started working on, so if I was to produce that map that I showed you there about two years ago, most of the west of Ireland would have been blank because we really didn't have much information on the west of Ireland at all. And when I started working on Beyond 2022, I came across a reference that uh, Philip Crossley had made, one of the genealogists that I mentioned earlier, uh, he made to uh, a parliamentary returns index. And he gave a page number in it. And I'd never come across this before. I didn't know what this parliamentary returns index was. I'd never heard of it. And over time, I came across three or four more references to this parliamentary returns index. And they were all uh, pointing, saying that the 1766 return for this parish only returned numbers. And I got this information from the parliamentary returns index. And I kept communicating with, with two guys on the project, um, Peter and Kieran. Uh, colleagues of mine in the project about this parliamentary returns index and we couldn't figure out where it was but but because the indexes were produced for the general public they would have had to be in the record house not in the record treasury because the, the idea was that you look up the index and you get the re you get the, the reference and then the records are brought from the treasury into it so they had to be in the record house and if they were in the record house well the record house survived so they should really survive and uh, we were queried the National Archives and they couldn't come up with it. But eventually, just a couple of weeks ago, about maybe six to eight weeks ago, we got a, a lead uh, on this uh, parliamentary returns index. And uh, I got a reference to it in the National Archives. I went in on the day I had arranged and I said, look, this is what I want to review. They didn't, they, they weren't quite sure what, they, they, they weren't aware that it existed. I went in and it gave the complete listing of the 1766 return, indicating what parishes return names and what parishes return numbers. And that means that I can now complete this map uh, in total. So it was a really, really great breakthrough. Um, <laughs> so we were, we were absolutely amazed that this had survived. <laughs> and it just changed the whole complexion of the project. And if we had found it about 18 months ago, it would have made the, the project a, a, lot more, a, a lot easier to manage because now I'm frantically working in the run up to the 30th of June to try to get the map completed and try to get a lot more documented on 1766 than, than we were able to do. But it has given us the ability to, to firm up on what parishes return names, what parishes return numbers, and uh, be able to come up with a, uh, with a, a valid percentage figure, which is above 50% for, for the survival of returns, which is we're very pleased with. Great. <laughs> Look, this, this was... Uh, yeah, this was something that, that I had... Uh, I had been hoping to do and had been despairing that I wouldn't have been able to do for 15 years and it was just that it was uh, it was just something that just just worked out in the end and it's, it's changed the whole complexion of our approach to the 1766 religious census and and given us this it's clarified in our mind that we're going to restore Re restore and recover over 50% of, 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 of this magnificent uh, uh, census. Which is Thank, thanks, Brian. I think just moving on to our, um, swiftly to our last question, um, the fact that many of the ministers essentially failed to obey the resolution of the House of Lords, would, does that indicate a lack of interest uh, about the census on behalf of some of the clergy, or what perhaps were some of the motivations for clergy ignoring the dictat from the House of Lords. Yeah, right. To get an understanding of this, like, all, as I said, all that map that I showed, it should have been all in dark green because all ministers were meant to return a list of names. But you saw that the vast majority of the part of the, the area that I showed was red. So we're only returning just bare numbers, just like we saw for Kalishal, something like that, which was, it didn't take long to produce something, uh, 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 write down two numbers and return that to the House of Lords. So it was only a, a very quick job compared to writing out hundreds or maybe even thousands of names. So it might at first appear that 
ministers weren't interested in the task. But I don't think we can actually take it as that. I don't think we, 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 because we have to understand how life was and how society worked in the 18th century. The ministers, even though the resolution said return a list of names, the ministers didn't know that. This wasn't reported in the newspapers. Newspapers didn't report on parliamentary dealings in any way. So the first that they would have known that, there was a, that they had to conduct a census was when they received a letter from the local diocesan, from their, from their diocese saying, do this. So the, the, the issue of what the Lords asked for in the resolution is a completely moot point, right? The ministers knew nothing about that. All they received was the diocesan instruction. And it does seem then that, so the key point is what the diocese asked them to do, whether the diocese said return a list of names or whether the diocese said just send back a list of numbers and just get rid of it. So it's the, so many of the dioceses, Clogher in particular, for instance, almost all parishes just return numbers. And we can't, I think the key thing there is what the, the what the, were the ministers being told to sell or to send back to the House of Lords rather than what the, the Lords asked for, because that was something that they didn't know anything about. So that's the key thing. And the fact that that uh, so many areas, like there are clusters, clusters return names and other clusters re return numbers. It seems as if different instructions were being sent to various ministers, uh, possibly based on local deaneries or local breakdowns, even within the diocesan office. Uh, there might have been three or four people responsible for sending out the letters and compiling the letters. So one minister, one per clerk might have got one particular area and he might have provided completely different instructions. So it's it's still a, a question that's quite open to us. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But I don't think we can say uh, for definite that if a minister just didn't return the list of names as the Lord's asked that that indicates a lack of interest because he might not have even known in any in any case. And there is one interesting response from uh, 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 a minister in Rafo Diocese, in uh, Letamaka Warj, in Rafo Diocese on the west coast of Donegal, where he writes back, and he provided just the numbers only, but he did say uh, in it, he said, oh, well, he, I'm paraphrasing, he received the, the instruction and all of us, uh, and immediately, the Protestant parishioners got together to start wondering what was all this about. And the, their expectation was that it was something to do with introducing more penal legislation, but it did qu quite cause quite a stir up in the parish, wondering what was all, all this about. So they just received an instruction and didn't have any, had the slightest clue what it was about and were only speculating on it. So interesting Great. indeed. Great, thank you. I think we might leave on that note, but thank you very much. And please join with me to thank you. <laughs> right. So I might um, now invite Annalie Margi up, please. Oh, oh, geez. Okay.
Gentlemen. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, we have a little news. Could I have Cunus, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I have Cunus, please? Would you mind taking your seats? We have uh, something extra to our program. It's not going to take very long, but if you could take.
privilege to be here with all of you. Um, I just was notified that they suggested that I say a few words, and I'm never a woman with just a few words. <laughs> privilege to read this to you. I don't think you've seen it or heard it. I said, up the definition of the glue that holds us together, you'll find a photograph of Connor McHale. Connor is our glue. Connor is our modern day McFurtis. Here's our brief information about Connor and our story. The origins of the modern day Oduda clan and the gatherings can be traced back to 1971 and the publication of the cl uh, collection of stories from the Oduda country by Connor's mother, Gertrude. Connor assisted in the distribution of the book and became intensely interested in the, con in the content. The book also influenced the foundation of the annual English of, is that correct? Of McFurbis Weekend School of History, which was held in Inishkron through 1987. A local businessman later made the comment to Connor that the foreign visitors were no longer coming to the town since the closing of the school, which sparked the idea, invite the Oduda to Inishkron. You know, the expression, build it and they will come. And that's what we did. They invited the Oduda to Inishkron and the gatherings of all resources of Connor and his mother, Gertie, collected over the years. Letters were sent to hundreds of descendants of the Oduda, both in Ireland and, ab and abroad in 1989. And at that time frame, um, the, there was a big Irish tourism organization which assisted as well. And the rebirth of our clan began. And we're very grateful. The, the first gathering was held in Inishkron in 1990 and has taken off with like wildfire. And the gatherings have taken place almost every three years, starting in 1990, 1992, 94, 97, 98, with a special bicentennial commemoration. Commemoration, and then in 2000, 2003, 2006, 2009, 2012, and 15, and 18, and again this year because we had a lapse because of COVID last year in 2022. We've had members uh, come to the gatherings from South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Colombia, Holland, Scotland, England, the United States, and Canada, as from all over the country of Ireland as well. I'm currently the Taoiseach, and I'm very pleased to have nominated you. I asked him when I first became, I said, I'd like to nominate you. Oh, no, there's so many more people who are much more deserving, mm -hmm. and I can't think of anyone more deserving than our Connor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kieran, very, very much indeed. Um, I have to say, when I knew of your nomination, I immediately, my face lit up, even though I was in a dark room, but I, I, I was so, so pleased because Connor has been not only supportive um, of all things cultural and Irish, but he has been one of the great supporters for the last th over three decades uh, since the foundation of Clans of Ireland. Indeed, he was one of the founding members of Clans mm -hmm. of Ireland. And it is he who has now uh, found this old VHS tape that we're trying to show you. Um, and it, he's, he's just simply been uh, terrific as a historian. He epitomizes the uh, historians, the clan historians that we espouse in that he researches at a very, very local level to find people of the name within Atuha who were joined not only by blood, but by association of the Tuha. Um, so I have to say uh, congratulations, not on, only on your receipt of this uh, award, but congr congratulations also for the work of a lifetime that you have done. Thank you, Connor, very much. I, I, I would like um, the, uh, two of the members. I would like two of the members of the Council of the Order of Merit, um, the chairman, um, Michael Crowley, who is about to blow the place up. I love that. And 
Dr. Ed Walsh, who has recently joined the Council of the Order of Merit to join me in making this presentation to you, Connor. Um, I would just like to say I'm deeply honoured and I appreciate it very much. I never thought that <laughs> nearly 30 years ago that uh, this, would, this is going to happen. Actually, over 30 years ago now, I come to think of it. Um, in the 70s, I became interested in the history of the Oduda clan and I became obsessed by it. It could well have been Manchester United, but as it happened, it wasn't. <laughs> so I researched and with the help of a great number of people who had already started that, that process. And um, I remember we wrote out in 1889 to something like 400 addresses and we got 40 responses. And I was bitterly disappointed. But in discussion with people who were in marketing at that, that stage, they said 10%, you actually got 10%. <laughs> and from then on, it just took off. Thank you very much, I appreciate the gesture and goodbye. <laughs>don't lose either of them by the way <laughs> now I just I, I'm not sure if we're Shane Sean either one of you uh, not sure whether we're able to advance this or not but I do know from Shane that we will be in a position to uh, put this on live stream and YouTube and all of that business which I know nothing about um, so if this clip will be sh it will be available to you if we are unable to get it now, and is that the case? Yeah. So we'll be able to uh, live stream it. So we're gonna we're going to live stream the the video itself as well, and we'll be making a recording of that, and that will be available. Yeah, we're just gonna try and play it for you. We're just gonna we've got a, a, a plan B, <laughs> which we're just about to do. So just bear with us.
so we'll make it. We'll make that available on the YouTube channel, so you can go and reminisce uh, anytime if you wish. Okay, and I think we'll move on to the next part of the program. Well, I'm going to hand over to someone more important than me. <laughs> I, I, I do even think that this is beyond my pay scale. <laughs> uh, I, I, absolutely, and, and we have thought about it once or more than twice even uh, in the past. But um, a huge amount of work goes into it. You heard me this morning talking about the volunteerism involved. Anybody that wants to put up their hand right now and say, <laughs> I will organize it, right? <laughs> okay, three hands have come up. <laughs> and this time next year, I would like the three of you to make a report in this room <laughs> and, when, and, and, and name the day that it is being done on. I, we all attend, I can assure you, but, but it, it, it is an enormous job to uh, organize something outside of Dublin. We, um, yeah, yeah, okay. We, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this again, and it's certainly something that we would, I'm sure, all support, but it, it will be an enormous job. Yeah, it's not only the organization of the rally, but the communication around that would make it imperative. Okay. There's a big, big job of communication. And you know, Americans are great. <laughs> we really appreciate you. Luke? Okay, so now to our second speaker. Annalee Margi is Acting Head of Department of Humanities and Lecturer in History at Dundalk Institute of Technology. Her PhD research titled Mapping During Irish Plantations, 1550 to 1636, focused on the surveys and maps created by surveyors in Ireland during the decades of plantation. Annalee has worked as a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen on the 1641 Depositions Project, which she'll be speaking about today, and at the Institute of Historical Research in London, where she conducted research on the property and charity of the Cloth Workers, Cloth Workers Company in early modern London. Most recently, she has edited a book with her colleagues Aileen Murphy and Eamon Darcy on the 1641 Depositions and the Irish Rebellion, and will shortly publish another book, Mapping Ireland 1550 to 1636, a catalogue of early modern maps of Ireland with the Irish Manuscripts Commission. So please go onto their website and look for that. She recently completed work on a cross-border project with the Amar Robinson Library and Marsh's Library to digitize and exhibit the map holdings of two 18th century libraries. She has written several articles on early modern mapping in Ireland particularly in regard to Ulster, and of course, in regard to the 1641 depositions. So without any further ado, I invite Anna Lee to the lecture. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come to talk today about the 1641 depositions. 
as you can imagine, um, they're very much part of my life. We spent three years working on this project, um, all of us working for different institutions at the time, but actually based in Trinity, so not so far away from here. Um, so this was a project that began back in 2007 when, it, when a team of researchers from Trinity College Dublin, the University of Aberdeen and the University of Cambridge embarked on a project to conserve and digitize and then transcribe and make available online the 1641 depositions. The project received a good bit of funding, as you can imagine, back at that point in time. We got money from the Irish Research Council, the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, and also the Library of Trinity College Dublin. And the idea at that time was to probably create what was one of the most groundbreaking digital humanities projects in Ireland at that point, making a very controversial um, yet absolutely inaccessible resource available to the general public for the first time. It was launched um, in October 2010 by then President Mary McAleese and Dr Ian Paisley, Lord Banside um, in Trinity. And since its launch, the website has attracted um, over 70,000 registered users. You now don't have to register anymore, so we can't track that information. But we do know that users are coming from all corners of the world. And many of those accessing the site are academic researchers who are interested in them as a source for the 17th century. But the vast majority of those using it are actually family researchers who are really interested in finding out mainly about the English and Scottish settlers who came to Ireland, of course, during the decades of plantation, but also then in turn um, about the alleged Gaelic rebels within those depositions. So the purpose of my talk today really is to introduce you to those depositions and then also to the 1641 project and to show you how, for example, the depositions can be used as a source for family history. So I'm going to begin by discussing the depositions as a source. Um, tell you a little bit about their geographical coverage and also their makeup. And then in turn, I'm going to look a little bit at the kind of social and cultural world that we can find out about in the 17th century from these sources. That's an area that's most close to the research, I suppose, that I do myself. So on the 22nd of October, 1641, the authorities foiled basically a plot to seize Dublin Castle. When a man called Owen Connolly, and I know we have some descendants of the Connollys here today, revealed the scheme to the Sir William Parsons. The leaders of the plot, including Hugh McMahon and Connor Lord Maguire, were captured the following morning. And on the same night, the news didn't filter up to my home place in Ulster, um, and the rebels began to seize key locations, particularly areas around Charlemont Fort and Newry. Yet what had begun as a relatively structured attempt by mainly Catholic rebels to gain control of the country soon descended into absolute chaos um, when, of course, the leaders themselves were captured and the rebellion began to spread nationwide. And it began to spread to such a point that it reached all four corners of the country relatively quickly um, in the days thereafter. Um, and quite often, the very earliest kind of activities were Gaelic um, Irish rising against their neighbours who had been um, in situ for decades at that stage. Um, we know that um, by the spring of 1642, almost the whole country was affected. And government forces, however, still did retain some areas in the country, including some of the key fortifications, principally along the coast. So Dublin stood as a place of refuge, Drogheda, um, Carrickfergus, Londonderry, Cork City, Yall and Kinsale. But as the rebellion spread, of course, more and more displaced Protestant settlers fled from their homes to areas that were considered areas of security, which were, of course, those towns and cities that remained um, in, in English hands, chief amongst them being Dublin. From Ulster, we know that some of the settlers did flee from Dublin, particularly along the south, but others fled back to Scotland and England. Um, and we do know that they would have used boats, of course, to do that from the multiple ports at that time. But as reports of the dev devastation spread, the Lord's Justices in Ireland established a commission to very much try to find out what was actually happening in Ireland during this rebellion. And a commission was granted to seven clergymen, as the late Aidan Clark recently noted to, and I quote, collect information about certain aspects of that rebellion. But the information was collected in a series of examinations 
or depositions. And they were taken from those mainly displaced Protestant settlers with the commission receiving orders to examine under oath, and I quote, those that ha who have been robbed and despoiled as all the witnesses that can give testimony therein, what robberies and spoils have been committed upon them since the 22nd of October last or, sure, or shall hereafter be committed on them, what their names are, where they now are, where they last dwelt, um, and who committed the robberies. So on what days and nights the events occurred and other aspects such as their traitorous and disloyal words, um, speeches or actions that they heard uttered or that were indeed committed upon them. So that body of evidence, of course, went on to become those 1641 depositions. And these then essentially are the witness testimonies of the Protestant um, in Scottish and English settlers um, around their experiences during the 1641 rebellion. The testimonies document losses, particularly of goods and chattels, the military action that was happening in the country and the alleged crimes of the rebels, including areas like assault, imprisonment, stripping of clothes, and murders, and of course, um, massacre. The body of material is very much unparalleled elsewhere in early modern Europe. So this is why it's a really important source. And it's probably the only source really that gives us very rich information about the social cultural world of Ireland um, in the 17th century. The depositions also constitute a very contested allegation or the chief evidence of the sharply contested allegation that the rebellion begins with the general massacre of Protestant settlers. The intention of gathering this information was, of course, to um, find out what was going on, but to potentially provide compensation for losses. So the bulk of the depositions actually contains lists of losses, not, um, not the most entertaining when you're typing out lists of cows and sheep and so on. But they were obviously the items of importance to the individual. But the second aspect of it was that they were going to be used essentially to prosecute those named in them for the crimes that they were um, the, that were that they apparently um, committed. So, from a genealogical point of view, these are really interesting sources because they're make, they're given by people about other people. So you can go in there and you can see that the very first line of every deposition begins with the name and the address of those making that statement. The original address, of course, and where they now are, but then in turn, quite often the names of all of those people who they implicate as well. So again, um, as I've said, the, with the remit of the original commission, the bulk of the content um, is about documents, um, documenting loss, but also um, around all of those various aspects um, from sort of murder and assault and so on. The depositions were given to Trinity in 1741 to mark the 100th anniversary of the rebellion, and they've remained there ever since. But due to their fragility, they've been relatively poorly investigated until the launch of the project by historians. Assumptions about their content, specifically that the rebellion began with that general massacre of Protestant settlers, was long predicated on depositions that had appeared in print in England almost in the immediate aftermath of the rebellion. So not surprisingly, a bit like the modern tabloids, they picked out the most sensational stories that were being reported um, and they were published. And they were published in um, books of, or pamphlets by the likes of Henry Jones um, and his remonstrance of diverse remarkable passages concerning the church and kingdom of Ireland and also in Sir John Temple's The Irish Rebellion, both of which were published as early as 1642. So news hot off the press. Other contemporary publications included The Tears of Ireland, again from 1642, which attempted to explain the course of the rebellion using the depositions alongside these quite graphic illustrative woodcuts, which of course would have incited, as you can imagine, pure horror on information, which was purely a list of goods that people lost. In the 20th and 21st centuries, I suppose, the work of historian Clark has been seminal in widening our understanding of the collection itself and also the evidence within it. And other historians like Nicholas Canny have begun to explore them, not around that sensational information, but around what tell us about the settler communities that lived here in Ireland alongside the Gaelic Irish in the 17th century. And now that the information has gone online, 
um, historians have focused on the evidence much more to explore that social and cultural world. So while the depositions were given by settlers from all over the country, there is, like every Irish source, um, disparity in their geographical spread. The actual collection comprises 31 volumes, which were grouped together by the 18th century librarians of Trinity on the basis of the county of residence of the actual deponent who gave the statement. This map of Ireland shows, for example, that the depositions for Ulster were bound in eight volumes, while the depositions for, Le for Leinster were bound in 11 volumes. There were 10 from Munster and only two from Connacht. But there was much wider material in, the, in those um, volumes than just depositions as well. And we know that within the volumes, we can pretty much trace depositions and associated material for every single county in Ireland. Academic work to date has focused a lot on Ulster, but analysis of the folio numbers actually tells us that there were far fewer um, depositions from Ulster, despite, um, despite what the academic scholarship um, would state. My own county of Donegal, for example, has only a handful of depositions and is bound in with Derry and Tyrone, um, but Calvin has two volumes. And then further south, Dublin had two volumes, and Cork had seven, which I had the pleasure of transcribing. Um, Leitrim, Mayo and Sligo were all in the one volume. So really it was quite, it's quite hit and miss, depending on where you're from, how much information you might get. But some of the reasons for that inequality in the information has been teased out by Aidan Clark and work that he did on the collection in the treasures um, of the Library of Trinity College volume, um, which uh, is available actually on the depositions website. But he actually put in place a structure to analyze them based on five categories of information. The first being the Dublin originals, the second being what we call the wearing copies, the third being the vice depositions, the fourth being the Commonwealth depositions, and then the final being a category of miscellaneous material. Now, the Dublin originals were the original depositions, as you can imagine, taken from about 1641 down to 1647. And we can recognize those very clearly because there's a real pattern of evidence within them, which always began with the name and address of the person giving the statement, but also then in turn told us about their social status, their occupation, and then they went on to describe what had happened to them. They always implicate the name the rebels, um, and then in turn, they're always signed at the bottom by two commissioners. Um, during the kind of early days of that gathering of information, a second commission was also granted, um, which sought information on two things in particular, murder and apostasy, which was effectively, at this point in time, evidence of forced conversions of Protestants to Roman Catholicism. And they were always termed as papists in the documents where it was stated that they had turned to the mass. The second collection is this by Waring. We liked these because the handwriting was nice. Um, he was the clerk of the commission um, and uh, his, his, pub, his kind of copies are really with the intention of publishing them. And they're bound into the county volumes from which they're copied. Clark then identified the third category, which are the vice depositions. And these are all from Munster. So anyone in the room from Munster, you're going to have the joys of looking at this. Um, they were gathered by Archbishop Philip Bice in March 1642, when it was decided um, that basically they didn't have enough information from Munster. Um, a lot of the information coming was quite northern centric. So they set up a specific commission to find out about what was going on there. They're identifiable because of the very um, distinct handwriting of Bice, but also by the fact that there are lots of lines struck out one after the other. And effectively, why he was doing this was he was gathering the information, but was really only interested in finding out, well, what was the absolute total of what these guys lost? So he scored out all the other information and just added the total loss at the bottom. And um, so monetary value, that was all that really mattered. The next set are the Commonwealth documents, um, again, which were taken during the Commonwealth period, so after the arrival of Oliver Cromwell in Ireland and the establishment of the Cromwellian regime, 
These were appointed in 1652 to gather the evidence for prosecu prosecution. Um, and again, much of them are about murders and massacres that had taken place since the outbreak of the, the rebellion or the alleged murders and massacres, um, I should say. They're interesting because they're given by the rebels. So again, their mastery is quite often of denial. Sir Phelan O'Neill, for example, who's implicated by absolutely everybody from Donegal to Cork, I didn't do it. That's what he says. So really quite interesting when you read them. And again, there's the body that we call miscellaneous material in there as well. So there's things like indexes to names, um, miscellaneous letters, and so on. Why they're actually really interesting for researchers really is that, um, and this why the, I suppose is to allow and enable that sort of processing of the information. And we know, for example, that the 1641 depositions, despite the fact that they've been there for a very long time, were really not being utilized um, by members of the public. They were, however, being very much remembered by everybody. So we know that multiple communities across Ireland remembered them in very different ways. So that the Orange Lodges, for example, in Portadown actually um, have you know, the, a really strong folk memory of this. And this is a current um, Portadown Lodge banner, photograph I took only back in October. Um, and that um, is something that shows how much they are remembered within the Protestant community. Yet I was struck in thinking about that, that I went to school in Southern Ireland, and I don't think I learned about the 1641 depositions until I was in university. So there is very much that, that kind of narrative within our own folk memory. So within the project, we set about working on conservation. Um, quite a number of them have been conserved. Um, and then in turn, um, we made those available. We then went on to digitize them. And the digitization was, as you can imagine, quite difficult. They're thick volumes. You can't really do much with them. They're quite fragile. Um, there's deep gutters. Um, so we had all of these issues, for example, like field illumination issues, which I'm sure the technical people at the back um, are probably more, um, have more knowledge of than I, but you can see it's quite yellow. Looks like a photograph I took on holidays in Spain, and you know, rather than, rather than um, a digital image. We also had areas like faded text, for example, causing problems, and we had to come up with solutions um, to all of that. We worked with a really um, a, a, a digitization company called Eniclan, who are based here in Dublin, who were amazing and did a lot of work with us um, to ensure um, that everything was correct. Then in turn, we have to transcribe them. So they're notoriously bad in handwriting, you can imagine. Um, there was three of us, this is us, um, sitting in our office in Trinity. Brian, you might recognize this. This is the sixth floor of the Arts Building. We had quite a small office um, and we were literally set up with two screens to do the transcription. Um, and so we were getting the digital images hot off the press, so to speak, and we were working through those volumes. Um, we had a kind of, we knew that we had so many months to do this. Um, and the aim was to get through about 12 pages a day in order to um, make those available online. Um, but again, we had challenges. Um, there was everything from the Gaelic Irish names to the place names, um, which I was often kind of brought in to have a look at because my background is historical geography as well as um, early modern history. Um, so all of this kind of stuff continued. We then had the thing that they went, hang on, these are three historians. Are they really going to know how to do the computing end of this? So they enlisted um, colleagues in Trinity to help us to automate that. So they created this markup interface um, for us and we worked very, very closely with them um, over the ensuing three years. And one of our colleagues, Shay, went on to build the Beyond 2022 project um, thereafter, um, along with uh, Peter in Trinity. Um, and then we also saw the publication eventually online of the searchable website because of that. So this is the website um, as it is today. Um, and you can go in and you can search through any county. You can search, um, as you can see, through four names, surnames, counties, and free text. And there's a much more detailed search, search option there if you're interested in particular occupations or so on. We also had a number of aligned projects as well um, from this particular um, project, um, such as the Cultura project and a linguistic analysis project, which took place by our colleagues in Aberdeen. 
So it's quite a large amount of information in there. So what do you do with that information when you have it? So um, as Luke said, I'm a historian who looks at maps. So I'm also quite interested in plantation society in Ireland. So for me, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do was to look beyond the information that had been so much published to see, well, what can I learn about all those people who I can see in my plantation lists, for examples, and so on, about what life was actually like in Ireland. So I began by conducting close readings, for example, of the depositions, particularly for a couple of counties. So I did a study in Armagh, for example, where a lot of atrocities have been reported from. But I wanted to know a little bit more about what family life was like, what kinship was like, um, what, you know, the, the sort of networks of families and servants were like. I also wanted to know, was it only men who deposed? How many women are deposing in that county? And I found 14 women um, actually, uh, you know, providing statements to the Commonwealth Commission in the 1650s and 18 providing information in the Dublin. They were describing themselves as a widow or a relict or a wife. So some had lost their husbands in the course of the rebellion, others were married or had remarried. So lots of interesting information. And we can find out about the fact that many of those were, you know, multiple, had multiple family members. So for example, Ella Matchett, who was from Kilmore in Armagh, also talked about the losses that her sister, a Joan Constable, had um, also suffered and she deposed. So you can look at the two statements. I know in turn, she then talked about her daughter and also her son, um, so that we can see how big the family unit was. Others also went as far as talking about their personal loss and their family loss in the depositions. And Edward Braxton, for example, from Sligo Town deposed on behalf of himself and his mother. And in his testimony, he referred to a brother, William Braxton, and a sister, Elizabeth Walsh, and a brother-in-law, William Walsh, Walsh, also from Sligo Town. And he described how the rebellion, that despite, the, during the rebellion, that despite them all being granted quarter, the two Williams and Elizabeth were put into Sligo Gale and subsequently murdered with 34 other British Protestants. So that's the type of information you can get. On the Gaelic Irish side, there are very interesting statements as well because of the fact that we see a lot of information about who the alleged rebels are. We don't get as much information about the Gaelic Irish, of course, as we do about the British Protestants. But what we do see are lists of names of those implicated for crimes. What can be interesting, for example, in this case, these are all from County um, Fermanagh, um, well, would be then to, you know, look to see that they give a statement then in the 1650s if they were brought to trial. So quite often you can find out more information. Using the 1650s material can be more fruitful for the Gaelic Irish. So we've Gildolf O'Cahan, for example, of the O'Cahan clan in Ulster, um, gave a statement which survives in the Antrim collection. And it shows he had quite a large Irish family. He noted how he traveled on the 24th of October, so just after the outbreak of the rebellion, to the town at Dunluce to go to mass. And when he arrived there, he realized there was no mass on. So he went um, to a James Stewart's house to drink a cup of wine. He was joined by his son, Manus, and his son-in-law, Henry McHenry, and they proceeded to drink three to four pots of wine. Um, as the day went on, they received news of the outbreak of the rebellion. And um, O'Cahan, his son, and his son-in-law, along with the brother of the Earl of Antrim, all went back inside the walls of Dunluce Castle. And he stayed there for a week. Um, he was joined in turn by another son, Turlock Og O'Cahan. And he remained in that castle, as I said, for a week, and noted that after that, he actually worked in keeping the route in peace and quietness. So he was trying to ensure that nothing happened. But in turn, he goes on to tell us, well, in fact, while I was trying to keep the peace, young Turlock Og was out there trying not to keep the peace. He actually was amongst the Gaelic Irish who was implicated for firing through the route and killing the Scotch wherever, they, wherever, so, wheresoever they got them as he hurt. So really quite interesting information coming out about the family there. We know also a lot about women. Um, women weren't always genteel in this period. Um, we do have evidence that some were also rebels. So that Rose New Riley, for example, who was the wife of Philip O'Reilly, came to Ballyhays 
um, with her petronel charged in her hand and the cock up and most imperiously demanded a note of a, mystery, of a Dr. Tate and his wife of all of their goods. And she and her retainers took away all of their goods, their horses, their mares, their cows, their sheep, their plate. They burnt his books in the fire, threw some in the dirt, the mini ice age, and it was a lot colder than the Octobers. We would have lots of stories of people perishing in snow and ice. Irish women, also, however, in some of the more difficult accounts, I would say, um, in the depositions. There's a really interesting story of infanticide, the only one I came across in the depositions in the Meath volumes, um, and it, or the Meath volume, and it's it relates to a lady um, called Ellen McKelvey, who lived at Castle Jordan. Now you kind of go, how likely was that? But eight individual statements all mention it. And they mention how, for example, she had given birth to a child outside of wedlock. They named the father as a Turlock O'Doran, who Maguire stated she was married to. Maguire reported that in giving birth, so the, the deponent, Maguire, Ellen had actually murdered her child and buried it in a dunghill. And the child's body was afterwards dug out by a mastiff dog. So some really awful stories coming through as well. But it got worse for Ellen because of what she'd done. The local government um, at Chicron, um, a Captain George Cusack, tied her to a post and burned her. And at the end of that account, Maguire informed the commissioners that his knowledge had come from the fact that, and I quote, he was present and saw the woman burnt. So it appears that society wasn't very rosy, as you can imagine, at that point in time. Um, and that things were happening that were quite often recounted that were traumatic, um, that obviously today we would kind of think were also part of this post-traumatic narrative of an event. But we can also learn, for example, that in some instances, society did function. We know that in the lead up to the rebellion, an awful lot of the settlers and the Irish communities were fairly stable. And many settlers actually also acknowledged their former servants in their statements. They recorded names, for example, of Irish servants like this one. Um, so Turlock O'Lorcan, Donald O'Lorcan, um, who had all been um, involved um, in, in um, events at Portadown in County Armagh, um, who had turned rebel essentially in soldiers onto a Tool McCann, um, which is a great Irish name. The depositions also provided evidence that they also have much wider networks because we hear an awful lot not just about them being servants but also about them living hand in glove. We know for example that they were recording lots of debts and indebtedness between the Gaelic Irish um, and the Irish and that system of credit was recognized in the depositions quite often in references um, to profits being lost particularly um, around lease agreements. So we know, for example, that John Babe from Carlingford, um, uh, you know, had lost, as he said, money's due from someone who is now a rebel. It's interesting that the Irish go after a lot of debt books, for example, and burn them in the early days of the rebellion so that there's no trace or evidence that they actually owe anybody any money. Um, we know in turn um, that they tell us a little bit about their lives. So very few Irish people are those with what we could say are Gaelic names to pose, but one did in Cork, a Mr. Owen McSweeney, who noted in 1642 that he'd lost an awful lot of goods that were related to agriculture. Um, so it tells us a little bit around um, his life, but he had lost goods to the value of five pounds and eight shillings. Not a huge amount of money um, by that day um, in terms of his, the value of his household stuff and provision. Another deponent from not too far away in Limerick, for example, a Sir Hardress Waller, um, who um, you know went up. Um, it shows that some of the, the difference. We know that a lot of the Irish were involved in day-to-day -day activities. We have one Irish merchant, a Mr. John Murphy, deposing in May 1642 that he and Athian Kildare had lost um, a lot of his good stuff like ribbons and silks um, and lots of other merchandise to the value of 160 pounds. So that reading between the lines of the depositions, you can actually sift out more information um, around both the Gaelic Irish and indeed the British settlers. We know, however, that the evidence can be harsh to read. There are stories um, of atrocity and loss, 
not least this by Elizabeth Price describing the massacre of Portadown, which I showed you um, on the banner earlier on. Um, she noted, for example, that 115 people were driven to the bridge of Portadown and that the captain threw them off that bridge to drown them. So again, that's one of the stories um, that, you know, really reflects. And she went on to very much, you know, um, reflect on that in, a, um, in terms of her statement when she talks about visions happening in the river thereafter and so on. So very traumatic. There was also a lot of anti-Protestant activities going on um, right across the country. There's destruction of Bibles um, happening. Um, you know, we had Alexander Crichton from Monaghan talking about how his Bibles and his service books were burned. And then in turn in Kilkenny, you know, how, for example, the tombs and the graves were, were dug up um, in order to make molds for gunpowder. So really interesting stories, but also very traumatic. Um, but it's not all that, of course. There are, is evidence also of both sides helping each other during the crisis. So to conclude, and I know I've gone on too long, um, the 1641 collection is a diverse one, one that I'd encourage you to have a look at. It contains lots of different material and lots of different evidence. Um, we know that that evidence has long been explored for the events of 1641, but I'm trying to lead a charge for more to be done around areas like genealogy, around areas that focus on the people, the places and the family connections, that focus on plantation life, that focus on urban and rural society and that look at plantation economy. For me, the publication of the depositions is a landmark in that it allows historians to really read the testimonies for the first time in full. We're no longer dependent on those copies. And we know that in turn, we can really look at local patterns as well as national patterns and to pl place these depositions in the context of other European wars that are of course happening at the same time. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Anna Lee. That's really, um, really insightful and really detailed. And certainly I can attest from my own research that um, the amount of um, nuanced information which you can find into depositions is fantastic. As you initially outlined, um, lists of stock, of cattle, et cetera, being lost, mm -hmm. but also description of household goods, um, names, and from Gaelic names, we can also ascertain patrilineal identities um, and also from a onomastic or um, uh, topographical perspective, names of townlands and so forth. So yeah. really rich to positive information. Um, so I encourage those people who aren't familiar with the, with the 1641 depositions to go onto the website and to search, particularly search the free text yes. for other things yeah. that also appear. I should say that the language in the depositions has not been changed. So it is still in the English of the early modern period. So. Um, we used to get an awful lot of comments into the initially kind of saying you can't spell, um, but no, we left everything as is. So if you are using the free text, um, you know, U and V was interchangeable in this period. S and F was interchangeable. So maybe try and, um, you know, uh, pull that out um, on a few different searches. Thank you. Yes. So maybe um, we can perhaps drill down on some of those issues that you've uh, mentioned as you went through your fascinating talk. So what can we learn about intercommunity violence from the 1641 depositions? Do we have some insight into some of the fundamental drivers, other than religion, which we've discussed, but maybe those at play such as economic or social disparities um, amongst different members of, of various communities? Uh, can we identify some of those drivers, perhaps? You can, for sure. I suppose it's really interesting when you see that kind of level of intercommunity violence, how quickly, in a way, society broke down in the immediate days thereafter. I couldn't imagine turning around today to my next door neighbor and attacking them within 24 hours, which is what often happened. But what it does show us is that there was, you know, society had generally developed into a very mixed society. Things in the first years of the plantation um, periods in Ireland had been relatively stable. It had gained a level of stability, I would imagine, that people wouldn't have expected. 
Um, and we know that um, some of that kind of, some of the deponents, for example, note some of the reasons why they go out in rebellion. And you can come across references, for example, to grievances of old in relation to land from the plantation. You can also see that they go out because they specifically want to target those who they're in debt to. So that inter interdependency in terms of money lending and so on. Um, so they are looking at that. We know that there were a number of, you know, contexts to this that Ireland was um, going through a period of economic hardship. There have been famines, um, food shortages. We know that there was, of course, plantation. We know in turn that there had been a very heavy handed Lord Deputy in the years before um, this that had also led to a welling um, of support, not just um, for rebellion from the Gaelic Irish, but later for the Anglo-Norman families as well, or those old English families in Ireland. Um, so that society just seemed to fracture quite quickly. So we know that um, you know the evidence and the depositions does tell us a lot about the economic rationale for it. It can you know lead you through those searches to find out why somebody turned on their neighbour. Reading between the lines in terms of losses and so on, you can figure out okay they're deposing specifically about leases of lands that they are that they don't have the benefit of, all of this kind of stuff. So it just they were some of the areas that were targeted. Yeah, that's interesting that um, perhaps the interplay of grievance, um, particularly amongst the Gaelic Irish, in particularly those areas which yeah. um, had experienced plantation, had experienced confiscation and so forth. Yeah. And does that, that explicitly comes up, does it? Does some of the Gaelic Irish actually some mention? Of them do. Yeah. yeah, but less often than you would expect. Yeah. Um, a lot don't give a rationale as to why it happens. Where you can find some of that information is in what they call the traitorous words. So that was something that they specifically asked them to gather. So quite often they will say, for example, that, you know, Luke <laughs> went up and, uh, you know, mentioned to me that uh, he was doing this out of, um, you know, the fact that he had lost lands in the plantation or his family had, or, you know, um, they might, that is where you kind of pick it up. They mm. would have been considered sort of traitorous words at the time. You do get references to Wentworth. You do get li li little snippets of information, mm. but you have to read deeply and, and find it. That's quite interesting, just on that point about the traitor's words. So these are recorded in English, but surely yeah. for the vast majority of people living in Ireland, the first language was Irish. So is this just a translation of these words? Do we have a sense of that? Surely in a lot of these areas, the, um, the Gaelic Irish were not, meant, were not saying this in English, or, or were they perhaps? I, I think that's an interesting. I think they possibly, I mean, we, we don't get, we don't know, I suppose, is the ultimate answer to that. But I would imagine that given that both communities had been, you know, that there, that for example, in Ulster, this, the plantation had been in place since 1609, mm -hmm. that there was probably, um, you know, where people were living side by side, an Irish person, a servant in somebody's house, or they would have probably had to be using English. Mm -hmm. So we don't know is the real answer, but um, it's definitely not something that's translated. Um, it's very much stated that yes. they said this. Sorry. And so what, if any, references exist to traditional structures in Gaelic society? So, for example, there are references to the Fili, the, the Shanachi, and other members of the hereditary learner class. Is there anything perhaps more broadly about Gaelic social structure which is extant in the um, 1641 depositions? Yeah, well, I, I suppose what comes to the fore quite often are, are people who would have been the head of society at that time, so mm. those who would have been effectively the chieftains. Um, so people like the O'Neills, um, where you would have had Phelan O'Neill, who would have been the most prominent member of his family being mentioned, um, the McCanns, Tool McCann. You would have had all of that, that kind of stuff coming out within the society. Sorry, I'm terrible with microphones. Um, so you would have had all of that coming out um, within, within society at that point. You do find um, references um, to you know, landscapes that are quite Gaelic. So what's interesting are the place names. Um, what's interesting are the family names. They haven't been um, brought into, you know, some form of English translation. They are quite often still there, like the Alurkins that I showed you. Um, that kind of information can come through. So you do see that there must have been enough understanding of, of that relationship and those names and those place names for them to be um, generally well kept. Um, I mean, there is evidence, um, you know, in some of the statements um, around the items, the wares that people would have owned, the types of things that they would have had that they would have lost, obviously on the British side, but you do get a sense of some of the goods on the Irish side. 
Um, so, you know, those types of things do come out. And what about things, so you just touched on some of the materiality things, mm -hmm. um, what people lost, the, the, the material, etc. Is there a reference to military technology? So do we have references to muskets? We, we have references mm -hmm. to pikes, of course, used at Portadown, but um, swords, um, besieging yeah. equipment, perhaps? You do get that, absolutely, particularly where military action is being described, which is quite frequently. Um, so they would be in quite a number of the depositions. Mm. And so what can we learn about the role of institutional churches? Uh, are there references to clerics either mm -hmm. restraining their congregations or perhaps encouraging violence to be inflicted upon um, the other community. Is there any reference of this in the deposition? There definitely is, and they definitely weren't restraining their communities, particularly Catholic clergy. Um, quite often they were seen as people who um, would have often been driving some of it in some instances. They were some who had roles in the background. Um, so there's lots of stories of, of um, the Catholic clergy, for example, having oaths and commissions and going around trying to get people to sign things and feeding messages and all of that kind of stuff around the country. So they definitely did have a prominent role. Um, there's kind of interesting stories that run through the depositions. So um, Queen Henrietta Maria, for example, who was um, noted obviously as a Catholic in England, um, there were stories of her friars um, being murdered um, in the depositions. So these kind of stories that were filtering across um, and populating the information and spreading around the country. Um, and then in turn, of course, we also have lots of evidence as well from Protestant clergy. So there, that's quite interesting in itself um, because an awful lot of them are deposing about losses on, on that side. Um, and their statements are interesting in terms of materiality, as, you, um, as you've just mentioned, because they describe everything from the losses um, of, you know, the household goods right down to their books, which is something I'm always think is quite fascinating, um, their libraries and different things like that. So there's, there's lots for, for um, all religions, I think, within the depositions. Um, mm some good and some bad. <laughs> Indeed. And maybe just moving on to our last question. So how do you foresee the publication of the depositions? I know it's online and subsequently mm -hmm. there are various volumes for yeah. each county being rolled out in terms of publication. Mm -hmm. But how do you foresee that whole corpus assisting family and, and, and clans violence or clan historians mm -hmm. um, in, their, in their own research? So yeah, so I mean, this was really one of the driving forces um, of the depositions. I think, you know, as as a historian, you get a lot of privileged access to materi materials and to source materials. I think that digitization has obviously broken that boundary and is allowing so many people to access information in a way that we couldn't have done before. So for the depositions project, of course, it's online. We also recognize that the online world, I mean, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of that. So we are printing them as well. Um, so the Irish Manuscripts Commission um, are publishing them. We're down to volume five at this stage. So all of Ulster is published. Um, Queen's County and King's County has been published and the Dublin volumes have also been published. And the plan is that we'll have 12 volumes in total um, covering the whole country. Um, so they're being rolled out um, about one or two a year at the moment. Um, for family historians, I think um, Gaelic Irish or indeed um, British settlers, descendants of British settlers in Ireland, these are invaluable. Um, of course, I think the information is primarily a British source, so the bulk of kind of the loss mm -hmm. information comes um, from for those communities. But for the Gaelic Irish, there's so much rich information in there, right down to family names, to locations, um, to the interconnectedness um, of those families um, into, the, into the, the British world at the time, um, to the types of roles that they took on. Um, that I do think, and I would encourage you to go and search them, um, as I said, through the multiple kind of variations of your surname, um, because you will certainly, um, certainly find people in there of interest. Yeah, indeed. It's a really idiosyncratic source, I yeah. think, if you take a holistic European view in terms of um, uh, reporting on massacres and, yeah. and so forth, yeah. but very interesting. Um, I think we might take one or two questions perhaps from the floor before we wrap up. Sure. So if there are any questions, um, Perhaps a lady here. I'll, I'll voice the question out just to make sure that we have it on the live stream, please. So, sorry. So the question is: Did did the researchers come across any Irish names? 
a clan name uh, and which may not have been readily identifiable perhaps um to me most of them were identifiable um they i mean what's interesting is that they used a lot of patronymics so um you'll have um we used to actually have a search facility on the website but in in preparing for this, I noticed it's been removed. So it was obviously something that wasn't being used. Um, so you would find, you know, um, it could be <laughs> Michael, boy, oh, Driscoll, oh, something else, something else, and something else. So we used to record all that information. Um, but in general, they are fairly well described, I would say. Um, the spelling might be the, the issue, and you might get somebody trying to spell it by the Irish O'Driscoll with the C-E-O-I-L, and then somebody else with the English variant. So that would be the only thing. But yeah, you can generally find them. Thanks, Currently, Queen. my family are even in there, which is kind of strange because we don't really know where our surname comes from. <laughs> <laughs> Another question yeah. there, please. Yeah, well, as a woman. <laughs> um, I think you don't often see information about women being described in that way in this period. So sources for women... Are generally are, are 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 generally less obvious than than this. They are often kind of the hidden part of an archive, um, and um, particularly in the early period. Um, so what's interesting about this source is that many early modern sources are written by men. Um, you know, we we obviously have an English queen in the late sixteenth century, but most of the sources that I would have used are, are male-driven sources. So a source like this where women were able to come and give their statement about what happened is very unusual. Um, and the reason and the rationale for that is obviously that they, a lot of them were widows. So they wanted to capture the information about what happened their husbands as well as themselves. Um, what's interesting about, I think, the, the violence of some of the women, now those kind of incidences, you know, they're there are only a handful of women who, you know, are um, probably the, the Rose O'Reilly's of, of the world in that period, but they are there. Um, and it's just highly unusual to see that that level of description. Um, you normally have to kind of really scratch beneath the surface to figure out it's, it's a female voice coming out in, in something in that period. <laughs> I think on that note, we shall conclude. So thank you very much. Thank you. Annalie, indeed. <laughs>
of Irish clans. I offer my congratulations to these groups for their historical accuracy. Clans of Ireland has also a higher purpose than simply uniting historical families and clans. It can serve all the people of Ireland, indeed all Irish people across the globe, by bringing an awareness of our history as a personal that it has a personal relevance for all of us. In my vision of the future of Clans of Ireland, an increasing emphasis will be placed on creating access to and public awareness of source material that you have just heard about, for example, that will be available to researchers, historians, and genealogists, either privately or in libraries throughout the world, wherever there is research into Irish history. We want to promote research into historical reality rather than encouraging emotional elasticity and self-inflating illusion. Clans of Ireland is committed to promoting public awareness of the importance of the historical and cultural material of Ireland through not only our member organizations and in turn through their members but also through our ambition to become more involved in the publication of rel relative historical works. We have been involved over the past decade in awarding prizes to the winners of the Chiefs and Clans essay competition in conjunction with the Standing Council of Irish Chiefs and Chieftains, and at the end of each three-year period, publishing an anthology of the best of these. Much thanks is due to Dr. Catherine Sims of Trinity College for her constant and enthusiastic support, and much praise is due to the Standing Council for its initiation of the project. The next step in this ambition is being developed, and today we announced our intention to republish the great medieval Gaelic genealogical tract, Linea Antica. This is a further advance of the Clans of Ireland commitment to historical research, and dare I say, is a massive undertaking, perhaps the greatest undertaking to date in the third of a century of the organization's existence. I hope that this will come to be publishable, uh, to a, a publishable conclusion later this year. Clans of Ireland is a representative organization of clans and families that have a historical, identifiable, geographic association, irrespective of creed or class. It is non-political, non-sectarian, so that as its chair, while I continue to be astounded by the irrationality that brought about the destruction of the Public Records Office in 1922, I recognize that this destruction of so many historical valuable documents is now of itself part of our modern history, part of the story that produced contemporary Ireland. History is a chronicle of our past, with all of our progress, regress, and congress of opinion that has brought us to where we are today. In looking back over the past half millennium, and in particular of the past three centuries, it is clear that the most divisively pervasive facet of our society has been the sectarian division and mistrust. It may sound simplistic in this almost post-colonial international era to consider how brothers in arms and brothers in blood who fought beside each other for self-determination should so quickly have turned on each other over the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. Some of us in this room had parents, grandparents, or close relatives who were involved so that this 
whole episode is extremely personal to many of us. Yet, it is inexplicable to me that having come to agreement with perceived common foe, they turned on one another with a result from a historical research perspective that much of the state and local records were scattered in the wind. Much of our nation's historical detail was vaporized in a flash of self-righteousness. However, through inspired thinking, science, and multinational cooperation, it has been possible to recreate much of what has been lost doctor, uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Peter Crooks and his Beyond 2022 team, including our speaker, Dr. Brian Gearn. This morning, I was de delighted to announce that Clans of Ireland has entered into an agreement of support with this wonderful project. Ninarth Gokur Lakela. There is no strength without unity. On that note, I would like to finish by thanking those who participated in this year's summit, particularly those not normally involved with Clans of Ireland, Dr. Gern and Dr. Margie. Thank you very much. Our two SAS, Daniel Curley and Declan Keenan, for their discourse on their prize-winning essays. Hannah McAuliffe for her insight into the Linea Antica project. Bart Connolly and Joseph, his brother, for, his, for their excellent tour of Dublin yesterday. Shane O'Kelly for introducing those of you on the video vi conference to to today's conference. Thank you all very much. And again, let me say to my colleagues on the board, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your dedication and support. So any second now, the Entry Grand National will feature. <laughs> so I won't delay you for too, lo too long. And of course, I thank you all for your attendance. Slán August Bannacht. Oh, and before I go, just to say, for those of you who are attending the dinner tonight, it will happen up here, unlike on other years, not in the card room. So uh, we will meet for an aperitif uh, in the bar, which I presume everybody knows where it is, um, at between 7 and 7.30, and then we'll get up here. Michael, do you? Oh, black tie, yes, sorry, oh, sorry. Yes, Joseph. <laughs> We're non-political, as I said. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much indeed for your coming. <laughs>